waiting for it to turn to 10. I was waiting for it to turn to 10 o'clock. <laughs> okay, good morning, everyone. Call the meeting to order. The agenda, is there any additions or deletions? Where did Tara Lynn go? We're already Remove the agenda and we're on to the next day already. <laughs> Sorry, I was thirsty. This, so the agenda, I, any additions or deletions? Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, we would uh, like to recommend to pull uh, the road closure uh, portion of, uh, of Township Road 121A. Uh, how the process works, Mr. Chairman, is that uh, the public hearing would be today. And then it needs to go to the uh, uh, the Minister of Municipal Affairs, or sorry, Minister of Transportation. Um, and then, but because of the election, um, we all know how bylaws work. If you're not in present present for the uh, the public hearing, you can't vote on it. So we cannot have that public hearing today. It will be at a future council meeting. So okay. that will be. So uh, we request, Mr. Chairman, for that to be pulled. Okay, pull three point one. Yes, please. Is there anything else? And so therefore, subsequently, uh, 6.1 would be as well. Yep. Robin? So that would basically require then that anything that we address today through a public hearing either needs to go through second and third or nothing, right? Correct. Yep. Okay. Any other additions or deletions? Not seeing any. Oh, I need to. Shane's moving the agenda. Sure. Shane's moving the agenda with a deletion of 3.1 and 6.1. Vote. Carried. Okay, with that, I will now open the public hearing. In accordance with the Alberta Regulations 50 2020, the following public hearing will be live streamed this morning and available for the public to listen or watch. Bylaw 2122, Cypress County Land Use Amendment from Hamlet Single Family Residential District to Public and Semi Public Service District. Bylaw 2021 24, Municipal Development Plan. During each individual public hearing, I will call for opportunities for the individuals to make submissions. Once a public hearing is closed, no further submissions will be accepted. Okay, bylaw 2021-22, Kayleen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Bylaw 2021-22 is submitted by Cypress County, which proposes to reclassify an existing residential subdivision within the Hamlet of Urban. And the proposal is to reclassify from Hamlet single family residential to public and semi-public service district. And the intent is to allow for the submission of a development permit application for consideration of a municipally owned campground. Over recent weeks, administration has been in contact with the county's consulting engineer, Stantec, to bring forward design options for council's future consideration. The development of a campground does not fit within the intent of the Hamlet single family residential district land use designation, and therefore an application to reclassify the lands to the appropriate land use district is required. The land use amendment is to be approved. The area urban area structure plan would need to be brought forward for amendment afterwards. If we can flip to adjacent land uses, please, Leslie Ann, and we'll just kind of show the area. Um, so to the west where you see the green that is currently zoned as agricultural. And you'll see in the, the blue highlight there where the proposed campground is located, that is all residential. And for the council's benefit, I guess we'll use the screen to the front. Um, there's a, a residence that's located up in this northwest corner here, as well as a residence located towards the east side here. 
The South Saskatchewan Regional Plan states that outdoor recreation areas are important for residents and visitors and provide areas for people to visit, play, and enjoy the natural beauty of Alberta. Providing access to nature is essential for the physical and emotional health of children and adults, increasing recreational op opportunities throughout the region by enhancing outdoor recreation infrastructure and amenities will increase quality of life and active living. Under the county's current municipal development plan under section 3.9 recreation, it states that the municipality supports recreation development in the area and that the municipality encourages the development and operation of regional parks and campgrounds, such as Sandy Point Recreation Area and the Cabin Lake Rec Area by local community organizations. Under the Urban Area Structure Plan under residential development, it states that the county will encourage development of existing vacant residential lots to take advantage of already serviced areas. The county will refurbish the water and sewer infrastructure in the former Lansdowne Equity Ventures subdivision and construct the internal roads as soon as practical to sell the existing lots for new housing. Under recreation facilities of the urban area structure plan, it states that there is strong community support. The county will investigate the feasibility of developing a campground or other recreation facilities in urban. If a campground or other recreation facility is developed in urban, a robust, a robust site selection will be followed. However, a location next to the rec complex will be considered as one of the site options, given the benefits of focusing recreation activity in a common area. We circulated the proposal to Alberta Transportation, and they replied that their primary objective is to allow subdivision and development of properties in a manner that will not compromise the integrity and associated safe operational use or future expansion of the provincial highway. Alberta Transportation has reviewed the information that was forwarded in support of the proposed land use amendment, and from their point of view, the proposal could be accommodated. The subject parcel is physically separated by the CPR right-of-way from Highway 1, with indirect access to the highway by way of the local road. Given the information provided to date and at this juncture, the proposal is merely a change in land use and would not have any appreciable impact to the highway. The subject property is within the noted control lines, however, given that setbacks will be maintained by default and all access to the highway will be indirect. In this instance, a permit from Alberta Transportation is not required and the development of the parcel could proceed under the direction, control and management of the county. Alberta Transportation accepts no responsibility for noise impact and highway traffic upon development of any occupants and noise impact and need for attenuation should be thoroughly addressed. We also circulated to Canadian Pacific Railway and no concerns were, were raised. And yesterday afternoon, I received a letter submission from Dennis and Carol Douglas. Um, so council all has a copy of this letter in, in front of them, but we'll go over and, and read it for the public as well. So the letter reads that we have serious concerns about the location of the campground and the size of the project. A campground will affect the value of our property. Living in a campground will affect us being able to sell our property in the future, as who wants to live in a campground? How will having campers around our house affect our safety and security of our property and our personal safety? We have lived here for 47 years and have enjoyed the quiet and safe atmosphere of a small community in a rural setting. Our kids have been able to run and play in urban with friends and neighbors we knew. Looking after each other with people from outside our hamlet coming and going, we lose that security. How will the campground be supervised? Will the campers just come and go as they please? Are you going to fence the campground? Are the campers driving by our house to get to the campground? Is this a summer camp or will the campers be parking for the winter too? Will I have access to a back alley? How will I be able to trim and maintain the hedge on the west side of my property? And how do I get my mowers from the backyard to the front yard without access to the west lot? Would you be willing to sell the lot to the west of our property and how much? Is this the best location for a campground and have you considered other locations like the complex or between the complex and the school or an extension of the rodeo grounds? How will you maintain a project for this size? How will you pay for it? Will you make enough money to pay for this project? And in looking at the plan, they have some thoughts to consider. Uh, number one, you have tenting area right by the railroad, which has train tracks going by almost every hour of the night. How much sleep will they get when the train blows its horn as it passes through town and rumbles as it passes and shakes the ground? You have the park a fair distance from the group area. Do you think parents will have their children play at the park while they are not at the group area when the train goes through? How long do you think the tree area will take before the trees are big enough to provide any shade or wind break? And have you thought about how much water it will take to keep the trees alive? 
Where will the people park while at the group area and will that affect people living near the group area? Will you pave Prairie Drive? Will there be noise ban at night? How will you control campfires? Who will control loud drink parties? Is this project too large for a small hamlet like Urban? Do you think you will make enough money from the campers to pay for the maintenance and building of the campground this size? And yes, there is a grasshopper problem. We had so many hoppers that when we walked through our yard, the air was full of grasshoppers. When you consider our concerns, I want to say we have always wanted Urban to grow and improve. Over the years, we have worked hard for the improvement of Urban. I have taught school for 23 years in Urban and have served as a fire chief for a number of years, helping build the department up by getting the first factory built fire truck and training men and women as fire responders. I helped fight the school fire and in doing so became allergic to smoke. Both Karen, Carol and I are allergic to smoke and living on the west side of town has spared us from being sick from smoke. We fear the campground will give us breathing problems. We've seen the town dwindle over the years and have worried it might slowly become a ghost town. I worked as a caretaker of the urban landfill for seven and a half years, helping friends and neighbors dispose of their garbage in an effort to keep the hamlet area clean. We want both the hamlet to grow, but I think that a campground in this location would be a mistake. It would be losing the only thing that would be considered for homes by turning it into a campground, which may or may not be a moneymaker for the county. I will not add much to the growth for the hamlet. I'm sure other projects will be a better choice. Whatever your choice, we will have to live with, and we hope you will consider our concerns. And it's signed by Dennis and Carol Douglas. So that being said, Mr. Chairman, there is um, three different recommendations that uh, administration is bringing forward. So recommendation number one is for council to move second and third readings for bylaw 2021-22. Uh, recommendation number two is council direct administration to bring forward the urban area structure plan for amendments. And then there's also an alternative for council to defeat bylaw 2021-22 at second reading. Thank you, Kayleen. Is there any questions for the planner at this time from council? No. Okay. Uh, are there any comments or submissions from the applicant? Good morning, Raven Council. My name is Terrilyn Osrud and I'm the CAO for Cypress County. Cypress County is the applicant for this land rezoning and I am presenting on their behalf. Cypress County began the process to develop a campground on the county owned property, which is commonly known as Lansdowne property, which is located on the west side of the Hamlet of Irvin. The land zoning process is the first of many steps to be completed. Just some history and background regarding the subject lands. Back in the 1970s, the town of Irvine created a subdivision and installed underground utilities. There was not a large uptake of the residential lands and the lands remained mainly vacant. The lands became the responsibility of the county as the town was dissolved. Cypress County has completed extensive investigation on future development of the lands. The current underground infrastructure does not meet engineered specs. If the current infrastructure is used for uh, residential purposes, the county would be in a libelous position. According to engineering reports, the cost to update and upgrade the underground utilities would be approximately $750,000. That would be to reconstruct the underground utilities. The county has looked at many different uses for the Lansdowne property. Upon investigation, utilizing the lands as a recreational campground has been deemed the most appropriate. As the campground is seasonal use, the underground uh, infrastructure may be utilized. Cypress County has retained an engineering firm to confirm, confirm this. In the past 20 months or so, the world has changed dramatically. Camping and doing other outdoor activities has become more prevalent. Campgrounds in the area are at full capacity, and there is a need to create more places for county residents and Albertans to recreate. Camping has, found, has been found to bring many positive attributes to our lives. Before council is the preliminary drawing and the bylaw document for your consideration. If council approves the rezoning to take place, the county will apply for a development permit, permit which will have a more in-depth design and more information. Thank you for your time and consideration. Do you have any questions for me? Sure. 
Geraldine, you mentioned that the underground utilities may be used. So we're not sure if they'll, we can or not. At this time, we're still confirming that if they can be utilized. So commonly in a uh, campground setting, it's, uh, it's not in depth uh, utilities that are used. They're more like higher up because you drain them and, and, and blow them out in the, in the winter time. Uh, so we're still investigating that. So that'll be a determining factor if it's feasible to go forth with the, with the campground, uh, if, that can, uh, if that can take place. Oh, sure. So the campground will only be utilized during the summer months, not in the winter. Correct, that's the intent. Robin? When you talked about uh, <clears throat> replacing the utilities, did you say 75,000 or 750,000? That was just unclear. It, 750,000. So 750,000 for the entire area? For the, yes, to redo the uh, underground utilities. So that and was what the two many, engineering reports. Okay, how many lots were, are currently a part of the lands down concept? 39. 39, yeah. Okay. So the preliminary drawing is to uh, utilize uh, the, uh, the curb stops that come up yeah. and divide them out. And it'll be a phased approach, but it's very preliminary. Yeah. Uh, the uh, going forth and spending money on something like the first part is to to rezone it, and then going to the next step after that. Yep. Perfect. Thank you. Any other questions? Not seeing any other at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any comments for from anyone for or against the development? You can come up and take a spot in the center here. And there's a button that says talk. Just need you to state your name for the Oh, right in the middle, there's a button. Oh, you're killing bugs. I was just, just getting rid of a maple bug that we <laughs> So you have the same problems we have. Can you just state your name, please, for the uh, Dennis Douglas. Thank you. We live at uh, number two Prairie Drive. Uh, been there since 1974. Uh, hope we be there a few years longer. <laughs> uh, I see you guys have done a lot of homework and stuff. Carol and I feel that uh, it's a mistake changing from housing to a campground. We're not excited about living in a campground. And I think it's going to affect our property values. We talked to our neighbor, Shane, that lives also in that area. Couldn't be here because he works and his family's gone through a, a death in the family. So they're struggling with that. But uh, I wanted to know on the east side, along the uh, Wilhelm Drive there, are you gonna fence from the uh, lift station up to the my property? Are you going to fence it in or is this going to be wide open? One second. Uh, Mr. Chairman and Council, the uh, right now there's no firm uh, plans, but that would be uh, part of the development pr process, and I would that would be part of our our application is to have appropriate uh, fencing uh, on for the whole site. That so, would be part of the development. So does that mean also along the lane of, uh, by my property going west too? That, yeah, that would be part of the the approach. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and it's, it's very preliminary design, what was forwarded. I can see if it's not fenced, people could just 
pull off yes. the road and pull in. Yeah, the only access that preliminarily would be from the south coming in. The other two, the other laneway there would be for emergency purposes only. So are you entering the campground? On uh, the south side. Down on Pacific. On the bottom end? Yeah, on Pacific, yeah. Okay, so we won't be driving by our house all the time to go to the campground? No. No. And that, uh, the just south of, of there would be just for, uh, uh, would be for emergency purposes. Oh, I see. And it's very preliminary. Yeah. This this is just for the re, like to to rezone. Yeah. And so, yeah. So keep that in mind today. There nothing's going to be developed. Nothing's going to be built. This is just a change of rezoning, so they can look at doing a possible development. When that comes in place, that's when you would be contacted for all these questions that you're being asked. Yeah. Well, we were caught by surprise on this. I understand there was a letter that went out listing the different uh, projects, and we never received that letter. And so when we received uh, the copy, uh, we had a black and white one, and then we got the colored one. It was uh, quite a surprise for us. Uh, over the years, we've, uh, we've tried to buy the lot next to us because of the situation, the way the barn that I have in my house, I can't drive my lawnmowers. It seems, seems silly, but I can't drive my lawnmowers from the backyard to the front yard. So we've been accessing the west side. And over the years, I've been mowing around my property for fire as a fire guard, which <laughs> uh, last year certainly ex showed how important that is. We've had three major fires from the train come our way over the years. And uh, yeah, so anyway, we were worried about that. So that's. That's a concern I have. Uh, I'm 75, I don't push a push lawn more and we have a lot of grass to mow and I like mowing around the property. So I have a ride on machine. So that's one of the concerns I've got too. Plus maintaining our, our hedge on the west side. We couldn't get at it from in our yard. We'd have to be out. Over the years, we've tried to buy that lot. The last uh, developers that we had, and they were surveying, we asked him to contact us and he was willing to sell us the whole 20 acres. <laughs> and uh, we said, we're not interested in 20 acres, we just want the lot. So he says, yeah, we'll sell it to you for $78,000. And we choked on that. We just bought a lot uh, in town uh, behind the, uh, over by the, by the bar on, on, what is it, uh, Wall Street? We paid a little over 20,000 for it. And so we couldn't buy it then. We've tried to buy it over the years, but it hasn't been offered to us. Our kids have tried to buy lots too, and they were told that they were not for sale. So yeah. that's one of the concerns we have. And of course the train. <laughs> and again, last night at two o'clock, we were woke up, which is our normal time to wake up when the trains go through. And I just concerned, was thinking about the camp, the tenting area. Are you really wanting to put tents there? <laughs> Those poor people are, are not going to get any sleep at all. And it has affected the foundations of, well, uh, Portis's house has been condemned because of the foundation. And I'm quite sure it's the train. When I'm sitting in my easy chair, and a train goes through that's heavily weighted, my chair vibrates, and we can straighten the pictures on our walls every day if we wanted to. So the train going through there is a real problem that you're gonna have to consider. Is there anything else with the property that you wanna? Well, we're not excited about living in the campground, but uh, whatever's decided will have to be. Uh, we're just concerned about how it's going to affect us. Shane too, he was he was had some concerns, but of course he can't be here. But no, that's pretty well it. Uh, worrying about the fires that uh, come from the train over the years have been uh, a lot, and. I don't know, you know, that's a big area. Are you gonna irrigate that and 
so the grass is green or are you just going to let the prairie wool dry up like it usually does? Again, at this time, it's just a land use change. So there's no talk about any irrigation yeah. or anything. That well, would be just, at a separate, I, separate I just, meeting. I just worry that uh, it's going to cost more than what you'll be making off of it. Well, we appreciate that. Uh, Robin, you have a question? Thank you, Mr. Douglas, for coming in. Um, can you just confirm? I'm assuming that can you see the laser there on the screen? Is that is that your property right there? Yeah, that is that is your house? Yes. So I guess part of my question may be here for staff as well, but to me, I if I were if I were living there, I would probably be as concerned about the idea of living within a campground based on the way that the map is. But I'm kind of wondering whether or not my laser pointer is not working now. There it is. If we were to come straight across here, the the idea in my head, and, and Dan's completely right, that we haven't gotten to the point of designing this space yet. I think that um, to have proper irrigation and beautification is the only way to do it right, um, which would also mitigate some of your concerns about fire. Um, I, I, I empathize with concerns about decreasing property values. I can tell you that everybody in this room is more interested in increasing the value of properties by revitalizing urban in a way. And so I, I read your letter, I read every one of your points. And, uh, and I think that there's some really good things in here that we can talk about and, and, and bring into our discussions as to uh, the proper way to design and make sure that we are able to provide security and, and not have long dry grass that poses a risk. Um, I, I get the concerns about the train. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a challenge. Um, but we also have the same challenge about, you know, actually building houses out there um, where if we can't, you know, the cost of putting in the services and then trying to sell the lots, as you discovered, it's tough to, to, we, we know that trying to put houses in, we would be in a losing position right off the bat anyways. And so I guess my question would be if, if that area to the south of your property came straight to the west and everything south of that was the campground area and we kept the, the houses outside of the defined boundary for the campground area uh, and it was done in a, in a manner that was, was nice and attractive where we were able to maintain security and, uh, and keep things separate, would your concerns change a little bit on that? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I think it would help us. We'd like to be in on some of the planning, at least be able to hear what's going on. We've been in the dark about this. As you can tell my questions and stuff that I have. And that's, and that's okay, because we're, we're in the dark on it too. This is early on in the process. Yeah. Um, I know it maybe feels like you were surprised by it, um, but the reality is, is the rezoning conversation that we're having right now is oftentimes the first thing that, or the first time that uh, residents hear about something, because this is the opportunity to come and share your concerns and share your, you know, your thoughts on it. And, and like Dan said, we're very early in the planning stage right now. And so uh, I would certainly hope that we can, uh, you know, involve you or include you, or you'll be informed along the way as to what they're like, because prior to anything happening, I hope that we can propose something to the community so that they can be as excited about it as we hope that the community would be. Yeah, just come on up. <laughs> yeah, I really don't need a mic, I got a loud voice, but I wanted to say, one thing, I don't think you people realize how many people I've had at my door asking me how to buy the property. You think nobody wants it, but every time we have had five children who wanted it to start with. Secondly, we've had people coming every year to buy that property, but there's no road to drive down to even know what is the property. That's one thing. The other thing is, there was always this problem of the roads had to be built before we could buy the property. That's been the issue with that land. I think you're making a mistake because right now, 
people want out of the city to the country, across the street from us, six houses have just sold, six. Why are they selling across the street and not there? I can tell you is because you can't even drive down it to look at what you want. If you even put a gravel road, which you have at our place for 43 years or 47 years, we don't have a, a special road. We don't get services on that road of any kind, winter or summer. Nobody plows the snow. It's not a cost of huge concern to put a gravel road where people can see this would be our property and we can go to you and ask how much it's gonna cost. The man he was talking about who you guys had buy that property and was supposed to service it, talked to me a whole lot. I laughed at what he said. Number one, he'd never been to Urban, ever, to even look at what he had. Number two, he had no idea what the cost of housing in medicine had in Irvine are. And number three, most of the people buying in the lots across the street from us have a good deal. And we haven't offered a good deal. We have offered nearly $100,000 for a little piece of property. The one we asked for that he said 70 some thousand dollars wasn't even a full piece of property. It wasn't even the service portion. I just laughed in his face. And every one of you would do the same if you were looking at what we're looking at, which is grass, no roads, no way to know that that was even a court there and nobody to talk to about it. That's been your problem is you, you keep passing it off on another person to develop it and they haven't done it because there are other areas to do a large development in. But why not do it in a, a different way than you're looking at? Why not access those people who are wanting to get out of town now? We just had a friend die in Irvine three months ago. His house is already sold. It's sold. The ones across the street from us, I went and talked to every one of them about this meeting. And every one of them that have just bought have said, this has been the best place for us to go and we are so happy to be here. They're not asking for a lot, you guys. They're not you guys sitting in big fancy place. You have done more that's a big fancy place and I don't see you picking up and putting this property right in amongst your houses here. But in Irvine, you're gonna do that. And we have a place called the community center where if you wanna know the truth, I have watched camper after camper park around it. Campers park around the rodeo. And why don't we put the, the places for them to camp where they want them? Because you know what, they're using them. Go out and look, we just had a rodeo. There were campers everywhere and they would pull in on Friday night and stay until Sunday night. There is also a restaurant in the complex. complex. You can have family gatherings in that complex and you don't have to build the building. All you would have to do is service your lines for your trailers out there. I noticed on what that lady said that that was a consideration out by the, the complex. It makes much more sense to me and it doesn't wreck somebody else's house. There are trailers already out there and there's two sides of the place that could have uh, places for parking. Uh, you don't have a parking spot planned there for your community gathering. It would be on our front road. So it seems to me that you could look at, at uh, maybe the fact that nowadays they're moving out into the country. One of the ladies right across the street in our area, I met her for the first time. She was unpacking her stuff moving in. That's how recently she bought the house. And she said to me, this was the best buy I could find in the whole area. Why don't we make those lots or houses, which we've already done, 
was already assessed and make it a good buy. And then you're charging people taxes and you are making money all year round, not just in the summer. And you wouldn't have to be building uh, a group complex. You wouldn't have to be doing all of that stuff. You think people don't want those houses, but I know if you put a house on there, they would buy it. And there's ways of putting houses on those lots that don't have to be all that expensive. And the one place I wouldn't put the houses is along the train tracks, because you're not gonna sell those. But the other ones you would. We've had people at our house asking. If we never have people not asking about that lot. It is the only service lot in Irvine. So why would you ruin the one spot that you've got already serviced? You have to maybe do some maintenance on it. And anybody who parks there that's a trailer is making a bad mistake. Just uh, a week ago, my son phoned an emergency call in when the train went by with a fire this high off, off their tires. If you had somebody sitting right there, you would have an immediate fire. We had three of them last year. They came right up to my house. So look how many trailers they've just gone by. My house was 15 feet away from the fires and we were fighting those fires. My husband was, was a firefighter. We provide hoses to keep our house from burning down. And that's not one year, that's almost every year there's been a fire, check your records. So you're gonna put trailers right where the fires happen and they happen in the summer. That's when they do happen, is in the summer. So it's, it's, there are reasons to, that you haven't done it before. Thank you okay. for listening. Thank you very much for your comments. Do we have any other comments? Okay, thank you. I will now call for any final submissions from the applicant or from those who feel they have not had the opportunity to feel fully participate in the public hearing. The applicant waves, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Has everybody felt they've been heard today? Yes. You're welcome. Put my glasses on so I can see it this time. The public hearing for bylaw 2021-22 is concluded. No further submissions will be accepted. Okay, bylaw 21-24. No offense, it's just protocol that we got to wipe everything down after. So. Okay. Kayleen. Great, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so I sit here with uh, Peter Vanna, who you've all met uh, with V3 Consulting. And what I'll do is I'll give a brief update and my report on the municipal development plan to date, and then I'll turn it over to Peter to give a presentation on the municipal development plan amendments. So this proposal is for bylaw 2021-24 for the Cypress County Municipal Development Plan. And that plan is a long range planning document that establishes the long term land use policies for growth and development within the boundaries of Cypress County. The MDP assists to guide council and decisions that affect our communities and infrastructure investments. In May 2021, V3 Companies of Canada was retained to assist the county in a holistic review of the current municipal development plan. As part of the process, the project team hosted various opportunities for stakeholders to become involved in the project, including a virtual public information session and various workshops to discuss the draft document. Um, those engagement sessions were reached out to the public, our adjacent neighbors, council, as well as staff. Workshops were held by registration only with maximum, maximum occupancy due to COVID-19. 
Under section 632 of the Municipal Government Act, every council of a municipality must adopt a municipal development plan by bylaw. Cypress County's current municipal development plan requires amendments to ensure that it is updated and current, meets the visions of the community, and is clear and consistent for the reader. The South Saskatchewan Regional Plan states that planning on private lands is primarily governed by the Municipal Government Act and instruments made under its authority. Municipal governments under Part 17 of the MGA are delegated with the responsibility and authority for local land use planning and development on all lands within their boundaries. This includes the creation of municipal development plans, area structure plans, and land use bylaws. Municipal planning and development decisions will, however, have to be in alignment with the regional plan to achieve the regional outcomes that are established in that plan. Under Section 632, Municipal Development Plans of the Municipal Government Act, it states that every council of a municipality must adopt a, a municipal development plan by bylaw, and they must address future land use within the municipality, manner of and proposals for future development, coordination of land use, future growth patterns, and other infrastructure with adjacent municipalities if there is no intermunicipal development plan, provision of required transportation systems, either generally or specifically, and provision of municipal services and facilities, either generally or specifically. And a municipal development plan must be consistent with any intermunicipal development plan in respond of land that is identified in both municipal development plan and IDPs. We circulated the draft MDP to Alberta Transportation, and they replied that the plan has addressed and incorporated policies and objectives that pertain to future planning and development matters that allows Alberta Transportation to comment and be adequately engaged and involved under Part 6, Transportation and Utility Infrastructure. Therefore, strictly from Alberta Transportation's point of view, we do not have any objections and concerns with the draft MDP as it addresses Alberta Transportation's concerns and will provide orderly and efficient development within the municipality based on sound planning practices. The MD of Tabor replied that they have no comments or concerns. And um, actually yesterday I received a email notice from Dallas Harrison. And again, council has a copy of this in front of them. I will keep my my reading of these comments to the first page, um, being that we're not dealing with the land use bylaw today. So I will just read off the comments that pertain to the municipal development plan. Um, so the letter reads that they reside on a ranch, which has been in the family for more than 100 years, also live adjacent to Cypress Hills Interprovincial Park, and feel these facts are vital for you to understand my passion for the rules governing the land on which I live. In reviewing the draft MDP, I wanted to voice my support of policies 4.1, 0.5 and 4.111. Keeping family on the farm, the county shall support rural lifestyles by allowing diverse housing types and complementary land uses in agricultural areas that encourage multiple generations of families to stay on the farm or within the ag sector, which may include secondary suites, garden suites, and second or in some instances, third dwellings. And the section for value added agriculture that the county should be flexible in subdivision and development practices to support innovative and emerging agricultural sectors that complement and non intrusive to existing agricultural practices. They would like to express concern about policy 4.1.23, uh, which is residential subdivision, that the county may support additional residential subdivision of an existing farmstead parcel or single vacant parcel if the following conditions are met. And the following bullet was highlighted that the applicant at the time of submitting the subdivision application must comply with the Cypress County design guidelines and construction standards for both the existing farmstead or single vacant parcel and proposed country residential parcel. If I'm reading this correctly, that means that both subdividing parcel and the existing farmstead would have to meet these design guidelines and construction standards. As many of the farmsteads in Cypress County may be reaching or over 100 years old, I find it difficult to believe that a 100 year old farmstead can meet design guidelines and standards. Further, I wonder if this will be a contradiction to policies 4.1.5 and 4.1.11 as stated above. Final comment regarding the draft municipal development plan has to do with section 9.124 and the county shall encourage compatible development near Cypress Hills Intermunicipal Provincial Park. And that's a, a correction that we've since made to Cypress Hills Interprovincial Park. That was the only submission, Mr. Chairman. And so therefore my recommendation is approval as the municipal development plan complies with section 632 of the MGA 
and the nature and intent of the South Saskatchewan Regional Plan. And with that, I will, uh, through the reef, turn it over to Peter for his presentation. Members of Council, uh, I just wanted to go over a bit of a, an overview to just kind of go through the process. Uh, I know you've seen this uh, parts of this before, so I'll just quickly go ahead and go through this. Uh, the purpose for conducting the uh, municipal development plan review in the first place was uh, four points, really. One was to provide a document that was uh, more understandable, uh, clear, concise, and um, one that engaged the public, uh, gave them an opportunity to uh, ask questions and give us a feedback and input into uh, into the municipal development plan and create a document that was uh, more easily easily readable and understandable um, as part of this and one that was up to date in terms of looking at the legislation uh, both in terms of uh, your municipal policies uh, as well as the provincial legislation that was there in terms of the process that we followed uh, we followed one in terms of looking at uh, understanding the documents uh, and the legislation that was there, uh, looking at uh, engaging the public in terms of getting their feedback uh, initially, uh, and uh, as well as administration and council to, to really formulate a vision for the county uh, and to how do we get there really in terms of the municipal development plan. Then we crafted the plan, uh, brought it back to the public, uh, made some final changes and we're here today in terms of uh, the public hearing and that final uh, component of uh, giving adoption to the plan. In terms of uh, legislatively, there's a couple of things that I just wanted to point out or highlight uh, that have already been mentioned. The one is that every municipality must have a municipal development plan. And that's really why we're here. Uh, it needs to follow, secondly, it needs to follow the uh, provincial legislation in terms of the regulatory requirements that go into the plan, as well as the, uh, the provincial interests, which are really come out of the land use framework and the regional plan. And then lastly, um, all the plans need to, uh, your area structure plans, your land use bylaws then need to be able to follow that municipal development plan. And that municipal development plan needs to be consistent with your intermunicipal plans uh, and the regional uh, legislation. In terms of the content, uh, what needs to be in a plan, it needs to reflect that, that regional context, what's in the provincial interest. It needs to really look at where are we going as a county, what's our, what's our future population trends and growth trends. It needs to establish and look at where are we going to house people in the county, what's the, where is future uh, residential growth and, uh, and hamlet growth going to go in the county needs to be able to look at your employment and uh, how are we going to foster and diversify the economy, uh, the local economy, and how do we want to see uh, industry and, and commerce happen within the county. It also needs to look at those social factors in terms of you know, recreational uh, parks, recreation and cultural amenities that are in the county and identify where those are and, and how those are going to be supported. Also needs to look at the infrastructure that the, that the county has in terms of where your roads, where the water and sewer, those type of aspects that, uh, that help to foster and, and uh, support growth in the county for the future. An important factor for Cypress County is agriculture. And so looking at uh, how do we wanna foster and, and uh, support the agricultural base, both from the standpoint of you know, looking at prime agricultural land as well as uh, irrigatable land in, in the county. Also needs to look at things such as hazard lands and environmentally sensitive lands uh, that are in the county and the plan has done that. And finally, it needs to be able to be implemented. And so there needs to be a robust uh, aspect in terms of how are we gonna monitor it? How are we gonna actually implement the plan? As part of this uh, municipal development plan, we, we were required to put together a, a community engagement plan. And so as part of that community engagement plan, uh, it was really divided up into four pieces here. So the first part was to inform the public, make them aware of what was going on, uh, what a municipal development plan was, and to ask them questions. So we, we did that as part of a, an information session that we did. We, uh, we 
put out a public uh, survey to the public. Second was to engage the public. And so we engaged council, we engaged administration, and we engaged uh, the public as part of uh, some sessions during, uh, during the month of June. And we took that feedback. And as part of the feedback loop, we then considered and put that forward in terms of some draft policies, presented those to council, administration, and the public again uh, in August. And then we're here today as part of that final piece, that empowerment piece for the public to express their views on the plan and to have council adopt the plan. So Jimmy, maybe just to quickly recap what we heard as part of this process and, uh, and how that sort of is, and that'll sort of outline how we've really incorporated that into the plan. So what we heard was that people were wanting to look at, you know, there's ad hoc growth and development happening in the county. And so how do we, how do we deal with that? We need to deal with that. We need to deal with uh, and limit fragmentation of uh, arable land and, and agricultural land. We need to be able to look at uh, the long-term economic diversification and the economy of the plant uh, within the plant. Um, intergenerational um, living on the land uh, is, is, was also a concern. That, uh, that was presented to us. Uh, subdivision, the number of parcels uh, and also multi-lot subdivisions was raised as a concern. Uh, recreation and tourism opportunities were, were identified. Uh, greenhouse and wind energy developments were identified as areas that, uh, that were of concern to residents. Uh, the relationship with uh, your, your neighbors, the county neighbors were, uh, were identified as, as something that needed to be looked at and also the need for additional studies to help uh, council uh, to inform them in terms of making better decisions in terms of uh, growth and development within the county. Municipal development plan is, is now structured in, a, um, in, in the following fashion. It, it, there is a, a vision statement that sort of guides you in terms of where do you wanna to get to in the next uh, 20 or so years. It's then underpinned by a number of guiding principles that deal with growth and land use, the economy, natural environment, community development and governance. And there's now also a development, a generalized development concept, which is really a future land use map that identifies where growth and development can occur within the county. Those, are, those two are supported by policies that help to uh, support the guiding principles and the vision in the plan. And there's also an implementation piece in the plan that identifies how we're going to get there, how are we going to implement this plan, how are we going to monitor it, and so forth. So when we were putting together the plan, it was really important that we looked at a number of considerations that uh, that affect how land use happens within the county. So those are things such as you know where where resource extraction is taking place. Uh, what are the existing plans that are out there in terms of statutory plans or intermunicipal plans? What are they saying? What are the environmental constraints in terms of environmentally sensitive areas, water bodies, creeks, and so forth in the county? Uh, what are the man-made constraints that affect where development can go, such as you know, airports and pipelines and, and those type of things? And also looking at agri agricultural land, so making sure that we're not developing on on better agricultural land or arable land. So that produced the, uh, the generalized development concept or the future land use map. And so within that map, we, we show where the, uh, where the agricultural areas are. We identify a hierarchy of hamlets and how they uh, exist within the plan in terms of which ones are growth hamlets, which ones are the smaller and rural hamlets. We identify where existing and future employment areas are identify where the existing environmentally sensitive uh, features are and the crown lands are. We also identify where future residential growth can happen in the plan. And it's important to note that uh, this future land use map is in line with the uh, inter uh, municipal development plans that the council has adopted, as well as the area structure plans that council has adopted. Just to highlight a few of the, the key policy areas that, uh, that are in the plan. So we've identified a number under agriculture, 
So in terms of conservation of irrigable farmland, value added agriculture, greenhouse development, confined feeding operations and how subdivision can happen on agricultural lands. We have identified a hierarchy of employment areas. So where are your major employment areas, where are your local ones and how do we deal with more localized ones such as home-based businesses. We've identified where residential development can occur both from an infill perspective where future development can occur and how do we deal with existing development. We've identified a hierarchy of the hamlets in terms of which are gonna be your growth hamlets, which are gonna be your ones that we're going to maintain um, and so forth and which ones, uh, so in terms of also looking at economic diversification, we've identified a number of policies that help to help diversify the economy uh, going forward. We've also looked at uh, transportation and your utility infrastructure within the county and from a broad perspective identified uh, where, the, where that is. We've also looked at resource extraction and renewable resource policies. We've looked at uh, community infrastructure and community services that are in the, in the county and policies for those. And we've also looked at intermunicipal collaboration and governance and how that should be going forward. Finally, we've looked at implementation of the plan and we've identified a number of areas such as uh, setting priorities and through your budgeting process, looking at uh, re regular review of the municipal development plan, looking at regular updates for your area structure plans and your other, other plans uh, that uh, influence the municipal development plan, uh, how to implement the, uh, the regional plan at a county level, uh, looking at community partnerships and the importance of those partnerships in helping to implement the plan. And also finally, the, the land use bylaw and the role it plays in implement and uh, getting towards your vision in the municipal development plan. Before council gives third reading to the plan, uh, we're recommending that uh, there be two changes prior to second reading. The first one deals with policy 4.117. This is the policy that deals with confined feeding operations. And as a result of uh, input that we've received from uh, the city of Medicine Hat and discussions with the town of Redcliffe, we're recommending that um, section 4117 be amended to add city of Medicine Hat and the town of Redcliffe after the words residential subdivision. The second policy uh, amendment would be policy eight Point one point eighteen, and that deals with wind energy facilities. And also within this, um, that the county should discourage wind energy in close proximity. Right now, the policy reads in reference to hamlets, existing multi-parcel country residential subdivisions. And we're also recommending that we add the city of Medicine Hat and the town of Redcliffe after the words residential subdivision. And those conclude my uh, remarks, Chair. And uh, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Thank you very much. Is there any questions from the council for Kayleen or for Peter? Robin? You mind just bringing up that last? The, the last slide there, last slide. That was 8118. I just wanted to pull this up here real quick. And, because I know with the previous one, the 4.1.17, you've got the 3.2 uh, kilometer buffer. I'm just wanted to see, is there a recommended within the land use bylaw? I know we'll cover off a lot more of the offsets and the distances. Um, I've received a few calls with regards to uh, potential concerns with proposed setbacks with regards to the wind turbines from residential development. Um, I just want to ensure that this was not uh, touching on any of the setbacks here. So I'm just gonna grab that here. Yes. So Mr. Chair, if, if I could maybe just explain this. So uh, within, within the legislation on currently, uh, confined feeding operations, the, the setback actually has to be, or, or whatever rules you're gonna have, have to be in the municipal development plan. Yeah. So normally what we what we tried to do as part of this exercise is to ensure that this is a policy document. This is council's policy document and the regulations go into the land use bylaw. Mm -hmm. And so really section, uh, so 
right now it's uh, section 4.117 does have uh, within the tri uh, area intermunicipal development plan or within 3.2 kilometers of any hamlet and so mm -hmm. forth. And so all we're doing is simply extending that 3.2 kilometers from the city of Medicine Hat as well as the town of Redcliffe. And under 8.1.18, in terms of uh, the policy itself says uh, that there shall be a setback. Um, the county shall discourage wind energy facilities to locate within close proximity to a hamlet or existing multi parcel country residential subdivision uh, and adding um, the city of Medicine Hat and the town of Redcliffe as well as to that. And what will happen is that once the land use bylaw is, comes forward to council, that will have uh, greater criteria uh, in terms of what determines the act, what, this, what determines the specific distance from those, uh, from those energy uh, turbines. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, I'm looking at the policy here now and it, it's, I understand. Thank so you. does that uh, 3.2 away from the city of Medicine Hat, does that, they're already close within their own turbines, are they not? Uh, that refers to the feedlot um, areas, confined oh, feeding operations confined is feeding. the 3.2. Okay. And, and the reason we added uh, city of Medicine Hat and town right cliff, if you, if you look at the uh, the tri municipal intermunicipal boundary, it doesn't always like in some areas it's further than three point two, but you do have some confined feeding within it. Uh, so and so all we've done by by doing this, we make sure that any new ones or expansions do not occur within that three point two of those of of the hamlets and the cities and towns. So if it already exists, it can stay, but you can't expand it after we put this through. That's correct. It would need to meet the criteria. Shane? Oh, sorry, Shane and then Ernest. Are we gonna put this, uh, Delcy Harrison, Harrison's concerns there? When I was reading that, it, 4.123, when it does state, you know, that uh, the applicant at the time of submitting the subdivision application must comply with the Cypress County design guidelines and construction standards for both the existing farmstead or bacon single parcel and the proposed country residential parcel. Like he had stated, some of them houses are over a hundred years old and we know that they won't meet design. Is that gonna stay? Is that word both in there? So perhaps I could I could speak to that. So right now, right now the uh, the county does have uh, your uh, design guidelines and construction standards. And so that happens with, with if you're gonna have a new subdivision uh, in addition. So for example, it needs to be, it needs to ensure that your, your lot is serviced needs to ensure that uh, road act, proper road access is provided uh, as part of that, right? So the county does have the ability to, uh, to look at the standards um, and, and perhaps um, I can get the county to, to, to maybe speak on, on that aspect of it. Yeah, but currently sure. this, this reflects currently what the county does. Yeah, and one of the things that we identified as an issue is in our current municipal development plan, we, we don't really integrate the requirements of the design guidelines and construction standards. So that was one of the goals was to implement that more into the policies of the MDP so that strengthens the ability to follow those requirements. So the design guidelines and construction standards apply to things like roads, sewer connections within hamlets, water connections, but it also applies to simple things like road approaches. Um, so there might be some approaches that are out there that may not meet specifications. Maybe we have drainage issues. Maybe there needs to be improvements to culverts. Having that policy ability within that document um, gives us the ability to make these developments that may not comply currently meet the current standards of the county. Ernest? Well, my question was kind of the same way, but... If you're gonna see if you have a hundred year old house, you say you're gonna make the design standards meet our current standard, if I understood you correctly. Uh, that seems might be kind of hard to do in a lot of 
place, or are you just talking roads or, uh, you know, roads, know. maybe water or something like that? I think that we have to keep it kind of generic so that we, we don't pigeonhole ourselves into only one scenario, right? So if we have something within that document that says that they must comply with the design guidelines and construction standards, we're not making it only specific to Hamlet developments where there's water. We can also make it apply to the, the more rural situations where we have issues with access. Yep, go ahead, Peter. Um, Mr. Chair, so I'll give you an example. So anytime there is a, a subdivision, and it may be a hundred year old house, it may be a brand new house, it doesn't really matter. But so we're, we're, you know, if you're going to create subdivision lines, you have to make sure that, so for example, you're not putting uh, the septic field into the new lot, right? And so you may actually have to require that you're going to put the tank and or, or the septic field you know, onto the right property, right? And so that's, that's an example of where there would have to be a change. You'd also look at uh, the issues of the approach, right? And, and to say, is, has this approach been creating a problem from a, from a safety perspective? And if it has, it, it also needs to then coordinate with the approach the, of the new lot that you're creating, right? So it may be a joint approach. It may be something to make sure that there's proper separation between the approaches and so forth, make sure it has the right culverts in it. So, you know, those are the type of things. It's not about, it's not about the age of the house because you're not really, you're not really talking about the house. You're talking about being able to provide services to that house, road and, and uh, on-site sewer. Bruce? Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying because we actually don't do building standards. So that's not relevant whether the house has three doors or right size windows or all that kind of stuff. This is getting in and out, providing emergency service uh, and sewer waste. <laughs> Flooding, I guess, is the oldest problem. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, not seeing any other questions. Are there any comments from any anyone for or against this proposed bylaw? I will now call for any final submissions. And for those who feel they have not had the opportunity to fully participate in the public hearing. You're good. Cypress County waves, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Not seeing any. The public hearing for bylaw 2021-24 is concluded and no further submissions will be accepted. With that, I will close the public hearing and we will take a quick five minute break and then we'll get on to the agenda.
All right. Got everybody here? Yep. Okay. Uh, Going to quickly the minutes from last meeting. Somebody want to move? Alf's going to move them. Any comments on them? Not seeing any. Vote. Carried. Okay. What number is that one? No, not that one. Eleven point two. There, okay, there we go. Okay, we'll jump over the nine point one eight, Carolyn. Well, let me find that in my <laughs> agenda. Thank. There is no background. No. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So before you is just a verbal discussion on a renewable energy road use agreements slash road standards. Okay. Uh, 9.18, so it's just uh, uh, before unfinished. Yeah, it's on page 235. Only verbal. There's no there's no background, guys. There's sorry. So that's why I was like if looking too, but there's not. It's just a verbal. <laughs> it's all good. Okay. Uh, Richard. Okay, I'll I'll start out. Um, as you know, on um, highways 41 South, there's a large development going on. 46, I think, is the number of wind turbines. And uh, also, there'll be some solar later on. Um, we have a road standard. And, and Kim, I'll ask you to jump in whenever I miss something. Um, EDF has uh, hired a contractor. The contractor has signed an agreement uh, for... Um, for uh, meeting our road standards uh, for access and then for whatever they're going to leave. Um, with, there's a concern by some of the landowners that uh, the standard that we have put out there is a bit, um, makes, makes it, I don't know if I should use the word excess, but makes it complicated for them to, uh, continue to farm the land in the uh, in the methods that they have been in, which is um, large equipment, uh, large parcels. Um, it, it just makes it for the way it is now to do a better, uh, continue to do a good job of, um, of farming, weed control, etc. The Concern is that on one of our road allowances um, that actually has been farmed as a one big section, I'm almost going to say, um, that standard that we have is going to completely disrupt that large section of farmland because we have, um, and that standard that we've taken from the count of 40 mile. Um, has a, a substantial ditch bottom. And, and that just prevents the equipment from farming over or across. They would have to cut up their fields considerably. And so the conversation today would be, is there a way that we could look at this and, and make an exception on a road, on our, on our county road that uh, leads to a dead end uh, the owner has the land on both sides and on the end. There's, there's no need to have a high grade road. So we have some pictures if Leslie Ann can bring them up. Uh, and I will, I'll try and explain to you uh, what we're looking at. So and this goes to a dead end, correct? 
Did you state that? It, it goes to a dead end. And the, uh, the one particular landowner owns the land on both sides and on the end. So this is not our, our road allowance. It is just a road that has to be built to access a windmill site. And, and what's happened here is that the topsoil has been stripped off and then the, sub, the subgrade has been uh, leveled, compacted to 100%. And then there's gonna be a foot of gravel put on top of that. And then the side slopes come back in again. Uh, the topsoil will be right to the edge of the road so that for farming and weed control, there is no notice, there'll be no ditch that uh, has to be, uh, that would propose a, any kind of challenge to farm equipment, whether it's the sprayer, uh, whether it's um, combine the seeder, or whatever. This picture is one of our road allowances. It's the one, it's running, I would say, I say south towards um, the Alcorta Hills. And if you look on the, so this, this road has got a foot of gravel on it. And uh, right on the right-hand side, Leslie Ann, if we could just have the next picture, please. That shows the ditch bottom that is our requirements for all the roads. Uh, any road that is um, developed on a, on a county road allowance has to have that ditch bottom. And that, that's just going to stop the equipment from going across. They're gonna to have to farm those smaller quarters. This is just a tower. I, I just took that picture just because that's the amount of rebar. So here's, here's another example of the road that um, it, it doesn't have that foot of gravel on it yet, but it will. Uh, uh, and then it, the sides will be, the topsoil will be brought back in. And that's what is being asked of this township road. Is it 100, 104? that could be put left in that condition so that the farming can continue to be done in the way it was before. I'm not sure what else I can add. This is the road that we're talking about right now. So this is the ditch that they started to cut and then the owners have come forward and said, this is a real concern to us. Um, we did not anticipate that we would lose, first of all, this much farmland, and also that that would end our practices of the farming the way we do now. And that's our road allowance. That is our road allowance that's running east and west right now. That's 104. Uh, Dustin and then Shane. I've kind of had similar conversations like what Richard has. And to, to my understanding is the landowners are are fine with the standard road going on roads that go somewhere. So the 104, for example, where it's a through road and they can be used by other residents, they, they understand the meaning of building a high standard road in that location. But we look at uh, that one picture, Range Road 41, where it dead ends into their field, they own the land on both sides, it, and it, it conflicts with their farming practices. Yeah, I, I look at an unimproved road allowance that wasn't there before, and they were the stewards of that road. They were the ones that did the maintenance on it. They were the ones that took in, uh, did the upkeep, did, kept the weeds down, and kind of relieved that responsibility from the county. By doing or making them build the standard on roads and roads that especially go nowhere, I believe that it's just adding more onto the county now to take in maintain those roads once they're built to a high grade standard and it, if they weren't built that way if you made them just a, a level standard road a, a, an improved unimproved road allowance i guess i would call it where say it was just graveled or whatever the it may be then at least they can still continue their practices and drive across them and not have to go to an approach to take and go from field to field to field and I, I think it's a, a situation by situation thing that we might have to look at with some of these because it, you know, it's going to be a different aspect in each situation as to if it's going to be like this or not. But I think in this case, it makes a whole lot of sense to not have it as a high grade road. 
Shane? Is the tower on their property? Or whose property is the tower going to be on? There's numerous towers that would be going on the property. Numerous. numerous. Yes. Yeah, on both sides. Yeah. Now, once you go, well, actually, right where I took that, oh, no, on that picture, that's our road. That's our road allowance. But on this picture, this is strictly for access uh, to get the uh, turbine and the parts and everything in. And then it's left as a gravel road so that there can be access uh, for the maintenance crew to go in and uh, do their job. So they're going to lose that farmland for sure, because it is a foot of gravel, but this way it, it, it's easy to jump across. Yeah. Yeah. New signing on that they're going to lose some farmland because they needed access yeah. in and out. I mean, that's there is just a deal about, you know, the farming practice, which I have no issue with. I mean, no ditch. Ernest? That, uh, yeah, like I, I had a farmer contact me because of the same thing. They've got, uh, you know, un, they've been farming over an undeveloped road lounge for a number of years. Now they want to build a high grade standard to a dead end tower and they can't get across either way. And like they said, if you build it flat so we can get across it, you don't have, it's a road lounge, but you don't have to look after the weeds. You don't have to do anything because we spray it. We farm across it. It'll all be good. And uh, it makes perfect sense. There, there is, why would we want to isolate these roads? Robin. I think everybody's kind of been making the points I've been thinking. Um, you know, we've talked in the last year, year and a half about um, not having it as every road that goes in needs to have a high road standard that we look at what is the intensity, what is the use, what's the traffic count. I think this is a, a really good example of that. Again, like if we were going to be having 150 vehicles accessing this every day, I would probably have a different opinion. But I think that the reality is this is a an access road um, to access the towers. I would be even a little bit concerned about you know, when you have a, a, a road that's high grade, that's wide open to the public, that's accessible by people, that's a dead end, you've got potential security risks and stuff like that as well. People accessing it, thinking that, you know, it's leading to somewhere, whereas this is, it's there for a purpose. And I would, I would definitely support just kind of uh, maintaining this as a, an access road that's level that would allow them to, to do it. You're losing the space for ag that, that the road is taking up, but at least you're not losing the road plus the ditches, which is probably doubling what you'd be losing. Okay, before I go to any more counselors, I, I'd like to get a comment from Kim on what his thoughts are on this. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so when we developed the road standard, we contacted uh, four other municipalities that have windmills because we don't have any windmills. So we're kind of looking at past experiences. And one of the comments that was was very consistent with all the other municipalities that we contacted was any reduction that you do in your road standards will come back to bite you big time. And it won't be now, but it could be 20 years when they're rehabbing the windmills or it could be when a blade's being damaged or whatever the case, or it could be a lot of times from um, operators that run the windmill after, because after it's all done, it'll get sold off and we'll have a different client they'll want access 12 months a year. And so if we compromise our road standard, excuse me, then we won't be able to have access. The snow will drift in and we'll be later doing maintenance because it's in a public roadway. So then it'll become a maintenance responsibility. About uh, accessing the property on both sides, nobody's called and asked or went through the engineer because I just texted him um, about putting in a culvert or actually creating that access because with a ditch, that's that's how you create access. You make an approach, and we can do that and seamlessly on both sides, so that they would have an access point. Um, so we did comp we did reduce the standard for internal roads down to a 0.6 uh, elevation, so slightly elevated road above prairie line, and then for stuff that was in our road right away, um, dealing with we actually took measurements of our fire trucks and uh, and just different farming implements. So anything under 
So it's, it starts off as an eight meter top, but anything underneath that, you're gonna make it pretty hard even for one implement to go down. So, um, and so that's why we, we looked at it. So if you're having grain trucks, so in a lot of cases on a wet year, not this year, but let's say you go back to 2010, you won't be able to get your crops out of there on a 0.6 elevation. That road will, will uh, suck up all that water moisture and we'll be re doing further repairs. So this was looked at it as a maintenance perspective for long-term for the county. And, um, and yeah, you guys can, we can compromise on any one of the standards, but it was looked at on a basis of what would be the benefit of the county long-term. So when we looked at a lot of these roads, there's not just one windmill on the end, there's multiple windmills. So this is, um, we looked at it as not as a dead end of road, but going to a uh, commercial or industrial development. So a little bit different perspective than what, how we looked at it from, from that. And when we were looking at losing farmland, we shouldn't lose any farmland because uh, the way when this is all done, it should, if it's done right backslope, it can backslope right into the road. And then you still got that, that ditch capacity but you can farm right up into that, uh, that road right away. So, so that's how we looked at it. And we were looking at it from a long-term perspective and also looking at from, from accessibility, not only from, for the farming community, but also from, from emergency services or even from maintenance on a, on a long, long perspective. So. Okay. No, thank you for that, Kim. I appreciate you, uh, looking into that with other counties and getting their perspective on what they've dealt with. You're right. This is a first for us. So it helps. I'll go with Steve and then I'll come back over this one. My comments will just uh, surround sharing some facts about the liability and insurance type thing. So uh, when, if something were to happen on the road, uh, the test of liability would lie in our policies. And if we did have a road construction guideline and found that we, that we differed from those, if something unfortunate were to occur, uh, we'd probably become in a more liable position. And I only add that to, to bring more facts to the council's consideration. Uh, keeping in mind, I'll just quickly touch on 532 of the Municipal Government Act on behalf of Kim. I know we've sp spoken about this before, but basically uh, it's council or the municipality's responsibility to keep it in a reasonable state of affair, uh, giving regard to the character of the road, the public place or public work and the area of the municipality. Uh, that it was created. So if, if there was a different um, standard to be adopted, perhaps that would be in policy in the, and give it a robust support to make those types of decisions. Thank you. Uh, Dustin? Kind of look at it from a little bit of a different perspective, I guess. Uh, being as none of these roads were here before, they were, sent, they were unimproved road allowances, so they're a prairie trail across the country if they're even that. Um, we're looking at... Uh, building these roads and I understand the spec and the, and the, the idea behind them. Uh, but I, I don't think the losing farmland is really the relative concern here for, for any of these landowners. I think it's the accessibility to move across it. And instead of having to take and wing up and move across if they want to take and use it as one big block of land. If I'm not sure if many of you know much about today's modern equipment or not, but when you're running around with 86 feet of air seeder, it takes an awful long time to take and fold that up and move it across the road to take and move to the field, especially on a road allowance that goes to essentially nowhere. If the ability is for them to drive straight across that, it makes the life a lot easier. Now, is there something we can do if, they, if the policy does have to stay with ditches? Do we put 100 foot approaches in for them? But they don't have to take and uh, do that, do all that extra work to take and move across it. That's an option I think might be able to be considered as well. Um, Kim. And thank you through the chair. And that's something that can be looked at. So if you see this picture right here, see that high ground? That's a perfect spot for what Dustin's talking about. You know, we can make those kind of uh, changes. Um, it might not be in a low spot, right? Because then you're looking at a culvert. And um, but if if we plan it and put it on high grounds, then then the farming practices can be we can kind of work together and, and into a win-win situation. 
and keep us out of a liable situation. Yeah, because then we would still have the road infrastructure, but we'd also be creating that access point for the for the farming aspects of this property. Uh, Richard, Ernest, did you have something? Go ahead, Ernest. Yeah, the, the issue is not the driving on the road. The issue is with the large equipment because they've been farming through these fields and now ideally they would like it so they could at least, if they not necessarily farm right up to the road, but at least continue back and forth. And when they spray, they can spray out all the weeds and stuff like that. And, and I think it is a valid point. I mean, you have a point about, but I'm of the, you know, the company in future somewhere, I think there's got to be a little, some middle ground here that would benefit all, protect us and, and make it more easy for the owners of the land. Well, absolutely. As long as Cypress County is protected, we can work with it. Uh, Shane. Yeah. With your back slope. You see, to your ditch, you can make it. If you have a ditch, your back slope can be gentle. If you drive down on Highway 61, where they just finished building and uh, repave, building a whole new highway, they're farming the ditches. You farm right up to the toe of the slope, you know, with the sprayer. And if Kim said, like there for an access point so they can cross over, they knew they were going to lose some land. When they agreed to get the windmills, they knew there was going to be access points, and that, and we do have to look after ourselves. But if they can cross, you know, without folding up on the hilltops, you know, through proper design, then that then um, we got to stick to our standard. Robin, so so correct me if i'm misunderstanding this but we we've, we've come back i agree following our standard is important but have we not created a vague enough definition of standard based on usage and traffic so what what does that look like because you know if we're talking about you know the 515 or township 100 or some of those main roads we've been talking about this for the last two years about whether or not we have high grade standard everywhere or if we're able to, in situations where it's gonna be for reduced traffic, I believe that what we've discussed is that our standard can be tailored based on Alberta transportation and that, that, uh, that schedule that we've discussed. You know? And so I, I'm not suggesting that there isn't you know, a standard that's there, but I don't think that it's a one size fits all standard either. But I do, I do think that, that having the 100 foot approach like you're talking about, which allows you to cross over, that may help to mitigate some of that too. Richard? When I brought this forward, I, I was just looking for, I guess, if there was a chance that we could return some of these roads that are being uh, built to a, a high standard so that the windmills can be accessed and I, I just, I, I was hope or thinking, was there a way that would keep us, you know, don't, don't make us liable, but can that road be returned to an undeveloped road allowance? With, as the county has the power to determine uh, which roads they want to keep as a developed road and which roads they are okay with as an undeveloped road. And, and right now it was undeveloped and, and the request from the landowner is to almost basically turn it back into an undeveloped road allowance. And we're not, we're not liable or like we're, I don't know if it would be our responsibility to provide access to those windmills. Uh, we do our regular roads and, and are we not done after that? And, and, uh, the landowner and the windmill company have to come to an agreement of how that windmill is going to be accessed. So that's that's what I was looking for. But at the same time, I don't want to get us in trouble down the road where somebody says, well, I want, I want you to build this. Uh, I want that road improved, but um, I, uh, I don't want to meet the standards. Well, we have standards for a reason. There's no doubt about it. 
The other okay. part that would be a concern is if uh, down the road, if that land was ever uh, traded to somebody and uh, somebody wanted to build a house down there, well, then we would have to build that to our current standards of a high grade road. I, I, I'm leaving it to this, to the, I'm gonna go smarter people and the more experienced people that could see how we can work with our landowners to make that happen. But yeah, my hope was it could be turned back into undeveloped room. Tara Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, when the, the road is constructed to a standard, uh, the municipality has the ability to determine if you want uh, that road to be put back to bed or not. However, we need to remember it is a public right of way. And so if they need to access their infrastructure, there's going to be an expectation. So when it blows in the hills and it fills in because it's flat, then who's responsible? The municipality, unless you have a ag written agreement that we are responsible and we're held libelous. So there is, we, we need to adhere to, to standards and if council wishes to deviate from that, then it would need to be a motion of council because administration does not have the authority particular when it puts, could put us in a libelous position. Uh, I don't know which was her, Ernest and then Dustin. Uh, well, we, we have a lot of undeveloped roads and road allowances. Road, we just did one down to the river that was an abandoned road. But, uh, you know, so, like these are level flat ground, most of these farmlands. Uh, I, I, I think if we can just say, you know, however you do it legally, that we're, we're not responsible for to maintain these roads, that uh, it's between the landowners and the developer that's doing the windmill. Yeah, I think there's a difference there, Ernest. There's there are some roads that we're not going to maintain because they're not ours, but this one is our road. But well, we're if it it's our it's our road allowance, but it's not necessarily our road that we build. It's our road allowance. Yeah, and I've I've got a number of roads in my area. By me, we've got old roads that people are driving on all the time. Uh, like we didn't take those out, or you know. They're not even in the middle of somebody's farmer's field, but yes, I think that uh, if nothing else, if we put at least go to crossings every so far, like you can't just put that down there, expect people to with their big equipment. To, I, I realize they're getting paid or whatever. And one more thing, don't those aren't those aren't these about the same as well roads or whatever where companies are kind of responsible for them. We don't look after every well road access. Well, the other ones that they're building, you're correct. They they are the wind companies, but this one is ours. So whatever we do to this has to be to our standard because it's still our liability. Uh, there's no oil or gas wells go down one of our road losses. It's got to be. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, what I would recommend to council is that uh, council directs administration to bring back uh, recommendations on how to, because uh, uh, we've, we've heard the, the comments and concerns, bring back uh, some recommendations uh, and uh, consider all of, all, of the, all the things that are at play and uh, we would bring it back to the next council meeting. Uh, Dustin first. So I also move that. And just one more comment to go with it is I have a hard time finding us liable of all these roads when we have thousands of kilometers of unapproved road allowances that we are liable for. We're liable for everything that happens on one of our public roadways within our municipality, no matter how it's built, whether it's unapproved, whether it's got a six meter top, whether it's got a nine meter top, whether it's got a 45 meter top and it's paved like the paved like a stadium. We're, we're liable for anything that happens on them. It, it, I think what we have to look at is where is stuff a good fit within the municipality? Is there a point in building a road to nothing besides a wind tower? We have well roads everywhere. They're, they access all, I have them through my place where they take in the access off unimproved road allowances to get to, to get to the gas wells. They travel them all the time. They figure out how to get through if they have to follow and they follow them. 
and the county is not responsible for them giving them that access. So I think it's something we have to look at because I have a feeling we're gonna have a whole lot more of this in the future. Mm -hmm. Robin, did you have something? Yeah, just I support 100% what Dustin just said. Um, and again, just it's why we have the conversation about having different levels of standards purely. Um, because if we can if we can get away with a low class, whatever that looks like, in order to gain access, uh, I think that this is a, a case in point example of why that needs to happen. Okay, so I have a motion on the floor for staff to bring this back with some ideas and some a plan to keep us safe and try and accommodate everybody. Any questions about it? Vote. Gary? Okay, before we come off of this, I have one more question on a different aspect of this. Uh, it's been brought to our attention that there's a lot of trucks going down these roads, 500 to 600 loads going down. And uh, we were asked today if we could, if the company can post a speed limit change or do we have to do it in council? We had a near miss in the past week with a kid and chasing the dog. So the dog wouldn't get hit and they almost got both of them with gravel trucks. So it's been brought to our attention that they would like to drop these speed limits down to 30K when it's close to a house. So who does that or can they do that or do we have to make the motion? So Mr. Chairman, I'd recommend that the municipality gives uh, uh, through the road use agreement that can uh, take place. So um, I would make a motion that that would be council uh, allows that to be part of the, so it just covers everybody, allows that to be part of the road use agreement and that in the administratively in the road use agreement, we would put that provision in. Okay. And then we would put the signs up or they would put the signs they would up? Put the, they would put the signs up. They would? Okay. Yeah, because it's part of their road use agreement. Okay. Uh, Robin? Yeah, I'll make that motion. I think that it almost qualifies under like a construction zone. Like Shane, when you were exactly. working in Calgary, you yeah. put the signs up and they can control that. Uh, that area. I, I would move that. Control the zone. Yeah. Okay. That's uh, Robin's making a motion for that. Any questions on it? Not seeing any. Vote. Carried. Okay, moving on. There you go, gentlemen. Have a good day. Mr. Chairman, can we just recess for two minutes, please? I, I need to speak to you about something. Yep. Two minute break. Sorry. Call a meeting back to order. Okay, so I'm going to do something that's very seldomly done, but the applicant is okay with it. I know we closed the public hearing on uh, bylaw 2021-22, but I am going to reopen the public hearing because there is a submission that was sent in yesterday that was missed by staff. And the applicant has agreed 
to reopen it with no nothing coming back on us, I guess. Is no concerns. I'm, no concerns. As That's the, the word I'm looking for. So bylaw 2021-22, I'm going to reopen and give over to Kayleen to read this submission. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So this uh, submission was received by Anita Miles. And it reads, good afternoon, regarding the public hearing re a proposed change to the land use in urban for development consideration to operate a municipally owned campground. I have a series of questions and concerns regarding the proposed new designation for the land indicated in the letter sent September 13th. Most importantly, this proposed public service designation is in direct contradiction of the urban area structure plan, which was finalized only a few years ago with major input from the public. General trend of the area structure plan was to have future residential considered for the west side of town and the east side of urban was to have majority of commercial and industrial land use. Since that very short time, an area of commercial land has been redesignated as Hamlet residential acreages on the southwest corner, Bull Trail and Highway 1. Now the empty lots which were designated Hamlet residential at the west side of town are to be redesignated as public service for the purpose of a campground. My question is, if a campground went in, would it destroy the potential for new interest in residential development in the future, and where would future zoning for housing lots be located? Number two, has there been sufficient market research to justify the capital costs of creating a new municipal campground? I know that there has been a shortage of camping space for the last two years because of Cypress Hills Provincial Park removing access to the first come first serve campsites while the pandemic is on, but is that sustainable market to cater to? Also, my understanding is that the Centennial Park just across the highway used to be a campground, but it was unsustainable for whatever reason and also subject to vandalism. Pardon my ignorance, I understand there is a lease arrangement for it at present, but is there any other reason why it could not be considered again, especially considering that it would serve our local municipality rather than non-residents? I'm playing devil's advocate here as I have no real objection to its present use. Number three, how large is this campground intended to be? What services would be included? Water, sewer, sewer dump, electrical, laundry. If it's intended to attract visitors for more than one night, I would say there would be insufficient services and attractions in the immediate area to make an urban campground attractive to long-term visitors. If the market research shows that it would be for overnight stays only, I would suggest that a super transient population is not urban's best interest. Overnight camping at the Welcome Center's parking lot might make more sense. From a logistics point of view, who will maintain the grounds and ensure compliance with bylaws, laws, campground rules? Please bear in mind that the newest, the nearest RCMP, sorry, detachment is located over 30 minutes away. I'm sure that the campground neighbors, and there would be quite a few direct neighbors, would not appreciate having to call in concerns. Also, if the mowing contractors for the county were responsible for maintaining the grounds, I can guarantee the grounds would be unsightly the majority of the year. They have a track record of not appearing in our community until the grass is at least knee high long along roadsides and in our own town park. Can a fifth wheel navigate the street corners leading to the location of the proposed campground? Would additional road work or infrastructure work be required? If so, and a campground, would there be any value in redirecting the truck route through town so it does not run past front of the school? A campground on the west side of town in our arid area is probably a poor idea considering the fire risk much of the summer and that many campground users are from across country and often from different climates and hours. I phoned one man smoking irresponsibly by our fence during the highest fire risk days of July. He was from Richmond Hill, Ontario and had no clue that maybe he needed to dispose his cigarette butts in the ashtray of his car, not on the roadside. Bear in mind that prevailing winds are from the Northwest and a fire out of control could conceivably put the entire town at risk and would that affect neighboring residential property insurance rates. If long-term residents have difficulty sleeping with the train going past less than, 30, less than 65 kilometers away, do you suppose campground users will enjoy their night's rest? Train begins to sound its horn right at its location of where new campground is proposed. I've clocked decibel levels in this location as high as 112, which is comparable to in level to a thunderclap, a live rock concert, or a jackhammer. 110 is considered the average human pain threshold. Remember also they would be staying in thin walled RVs and tents, not in insulated dwellings. Having said all this, a campground would be a wonderful way to highlight our community, heritage, and our artists, particularly our local chainsaw carver and other artists and our local dinosaur, but should be completed with input from our local community. 
I think it would work in conjunction with the Welcome Center, but that's presently in Walsh. And I really think a Welcome Center needs to be visible along the highway. I'd be highly supportive of a campground on the east side of town where there are dining and bar services, no close residents, more events, and with an agreement with the Urban and District Ag Society. There could be access perhaps to showering facilities and the canteen at the sportsplex. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Unfortunately, I'm unable to be present at the meeting because of childcare concerns, but we'll be watching live and it's signed by Anita Chris. Thank you, Kayleen. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, can we get a copy of that over lunch, perhaps? Thanks. Curtis? I just have one comment that uh, she was wondering why the campground on the south side of the highway was abandoned. It's because when we had the flood, it was totally overran. Wiped out, yeah. Okay, does the applicant have any statement? Waves, Mr. Chairman. All right, I will, the public hearing for this bylaw 2021-22 is concluded and now no further submissions will be accepted. Yeah. <laughs> All right, it's 12 o'clock is lunch here. Okay, we'll take a quick half an hour and then we'll get back at this.
Richard wanted a warning, so here's his 30 second warning. He didn't say how long. Okay, I'll call the meeting back to order. Yeah, 5.1, Tara Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before you is a request from uh, 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 a uh, interested developer uh, that would like to present to council their idea in, uh, in closed session uh, for the November 2nd meeting. Will everybody jump at once? <laughs> no. Somebody make a motion. Richard? No. <laughs> Jesus. For a delegation. For a delegation would like to present in closed session. I'm just adding that. Oh, okay. Then when they come in on they like to come in November 2nd and share what their what their plans are. Uh, and it's confidential in nature, and they would like to present you in closed session. I just wanted to make sure that. <laughs> oh, it's okay. It's all right. So you're still making the motion to allow them? All right. Here we go. We <laughs> no, that's November, isn't it? All right. I have a motion on the floor to accept the delegation. Whoa. Carried. Okay. Now we're back on track. Let's go. 6.1. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before you is the bylaw for 2021-22 uh, land use amendment, uh, second and third reading. The public hearing uh, just concluded. Well, it did the second time. No, no road closure. That's over. Yeah, the road closure. We had pulled that, Mr. Chairman. Six point one point one. It's on page 44. Okay, I'm looking for a second reading. Robin? Yeah, I'll, I'll move second. Um, while I've got the floor, I just based on, based on the comments and based on the letter that was read and then distributed at uh, lunch, um, I'm of the opinion that we should uh, postpone this. Um, and and send this back for a little bit more uh, research. I don't know that we're in a in a massive panic at this point. Um, I think that there's some things that some information that may come out in the coming months with regards to the the rail line going through uh, through the town there. If if we are successful in getting that to slow down a little bit, that might help. Um, I think that the boundary might need to be reconsidered um, to go straight across instead of going around. I think that that would definitely, um, that would detract from property values, I, I, I believe, but if we could, you know, have a look at that. And, uh, and then also just to kind of do a little bit, like there's that this letter from Anita had, had some good points that I think that we could look into. So my, my recommendation that is that we, postpone this and bring this back at a later date. Okay, well, we can't do that today. We either put it through or it's lost and it has to be a public hearing redone. That was explained at the beginning of the council meeting. All the public hearings that were done today either have second and third reading 
or they're lost and we have to redo a whole public hearing for it. So, which is fine if you want to do that, but this is just for the reclassification of the land. So it's not stating that we have to follow those boundaries when the time comes to do a campground, we can exchange those boundaries and we can make it all work for the concerns that have been here. This is just a reclassification. This isn't saying that it's even going to go in. It just gives the possibility to look at it to go in. Technically, though, we can we can look at it to go in without reclassifying. You just can't do it. Like to, to have a conversation on a conceptual level wouldn't wouldn't matter. And I think that the optics of a postponement, even though it would result in having to start from scratch, is different than a defeat a defeat would imply down the road at a different council that we looked at it didn't like it and just said no um if a postponement knowingly leads to it being nullified i would prefer that than than the alternative you know the alternative and i don't think that based on what we've we had today in the questions that to approve it as it is with the existing boundary we if we ended up changing location then we'd have to have another reclassification to bring it back to commercial to residential if that was the case so um i would still my position would be that we still look at postponing jeffrey yeah and i guess um for council's benefit i guess as a consideration of what councillor kirby white is proposing is that um you know to actually um redo the bylaw aside from the costs and the the time from staff's point of view really you're looking at a month from the time you get first reading to advertise it and circulate the notifications again to the point where you can have the public hearing so you're looking at about approximately a month to uh, you know to have that process again any other questions or comments Ernest? Well, since we're only approving the concept, basically, I, I don't see why we couldn't do that because we next council can always adjust it however they want. At least it's, you know, the groundwork is laid and uh, we're going forward. Uh, I mean, this piece of ground has been for sale or being developed or whatever since well, most of us have been on council and this is close as we've come to get anything done. So. I think we should take the, just go ahead and improve this and move ahead and we'll make the adjustments as required in the future. Okay, any other questions or comments? <clears throat> Michelle? I think I agree with Ernest. Like there's to postpone this and drag it on, even if we were to get a campground, like it wouldn't be finished for next summer. It would be the summer after by the time we, we keep doing this. So I think I'm a guy, we agree with Ernest that we should just keep moving forward with it. Anybody else? No? Yeah, I can, I can see where Robin's coming from it too. Like, you know, I got concerns also, eh? but, but still like, you know, I, I, I think like, you know, the right decision would to move, move on with this and, um, you know, we can address these problems, like, you know, as they come up, you know, when we move ahead with this. Richard? It was a little slow on the draw because of getting beat up so bad here by Shane, but uh, I was going to go with a revised proposal with a amended boundary. And, uh, but that, if, if I'm correct, that can still happen next year uh and we can still approve this and we can still put that in there then next year and have major discussions correct is yep. that correct so yeah you could do a, a revised proposal where um, perhaps you take a portion of that public service and let it remain as as residential you could rezone the whole entire area as proposed right now, rezone that to public service, and then thereafter have a new bylaw to put it back to residential. Um, those would be really the, the two options, but either way, um, you need a, a new public hearing if it's a, a new application coming forward, right? Justin? I feel so switching it all over is not really the end of the world because then it gives us the options to draw our boundaries wherever we want. 
And if it stays as a public service district, it's we don't really want to add residential in there beside anyways. So because around the camp, if we do go ahead with the campground, it gives us the option to draw the boundaries with whatever magic marker and whatever place we want and have nothing else be built in a residential area or without having to be rezoned again. That's the way I look at it. So I actually think it's moving the whole thing ahead as a public service district and then uh what we do with it after that we can decide at that time robin <clears throat> so hearing what you're saying i still think that we're doing this backwards because what we just had was we've got an idea we know that we need to talk about boundaries we know we need to mitigate some of the concerns and the risks i don't see why we can't have a conceptual conversation basically proposed to our ratepayers and the and the community members what this could look like answering some of the questions prior to putting the, you know, doing a reclassification, because what I've just heard is that if we move this forward to, for the sake of moving it forward, uh, we can always bring it back and redo the boundaries, which means that we're gonna have to do another reclassification hearing in the spring, which doesn't lose us any momentum if we just postponed it right now, ha continued having conversations based on a motion of council to do a viability study on whether or not a campground is feasible, and do a, a, a you know a basic design based on what we've heard today, and then bring forward a proposal in the spring for this with the boundaries being defined very clearly, having you know answered some of the questions, proposing a vision for what it's going to be like, basically doing a mini public consultation anyways because we want buy-in um, from the, the the community, and then going forward, I don't see how this loses an ounce of momentum or an ounce of time by postponing doing the research prior to doing this because it's gonna have to come back anyways if we're gonna read redraw the boundary not necessarily if we leave the we can leave the whole area as that zone and just use a portion of the area for the campground and never change that back over to residential it could always stay that way and it could become a green space and that's exactly what i was just going to say a public service district could be simply a green space and, and we could give and, the boundaries and, and everything else. I think if we're looking at building a, a campground in the vicinity, why would we want to put residential right beside the campground? We, I, I much further have green space, and then it just alleviates some of that problem that could come from down the road. That, that's my opinion on it. Yeah, well, that's, go ahead, Shane. The, uh, with the residential lots, it's, we're back to where we were with the way it is. You know, like Dustin said, the green space, because we don't want to go with residential because water and sewer doesn't meet up. Then we got to pave. And we heard, then you're looking at your lots are going to be 80 to 100,000 to regroup your costs. And we heard some of the residents say that they wouldn't pay 75,000 for a lot. So how are we going to win? If we're lots are going to be over eighty thousand, if we do all that work, and we can't sell them, so it's better off for uh, just to zone the whole thing and put the, uh, the portion into a green space. Okay, Jeffrey. Thank you, Mr. Reeve. Uh, just from um, I guess once councils had their discussion on the actual proposal itself, I just kind of wanted to reiterate the technical aspect from the procedural part of the bylaw. And um, so I can either do that now or I can defer to, you know, I don't want to break up the momentum of the conversation here, but I think I do, I do want to kind of reiterate from the administration's point of view about the procedure of, of um, council's participation with the public hearing that we've just had and going forward with um, making a decision on either second or third reading. Well, I'm about to ask for the question to be voted on. So you okay. should say. So in the past, um, with an election coming up, um, I have, you know, Cypress County has had experience with having a bylaw that um, carries forward into the new council um, once the election has been held. And so as long as, you know, technically we've got a majority of, a, you know, a majority of council that we have, uh, you know, at least five members present that are returning and we've got a quorum and um, any new members um, in the past, any new members that were elected to council would not be eligible to vote on second or third reading because they did not participate in the public hearing. Mm -hmm. So 
going, so that's the risk you run. So if you wanted to postpone this going forward, we just have to make sure that, or well, we can't make sure, but that's the risk that we would have a quorum of council that was already um, present today that heard the public hearing that would make it, um, you know, eligible that you that that quorum would be able to, to vote on second and third reading because they heard the public hearing. So, okay. so that's the risk if you want to postpone it. Okay. You just you have to make sure you have enough that. We're here today. Mr. Chairman, can I just talk about the process? So right now, the pro as you're hearing this as the governing body to change the land zoning. Okay, so there's two separate parts to this. So as the applicant, there is another, another part of it. So as the applicant, we've heard the concerns. So we would, if, if it is rezoned, then council, we would uh, engage the consultant, make sure we can utilize the, so this is, there are two separate items. Mm -hmm. So then you would uh, see if we can use the underground infrastructure, get a conceptual design, engage as the applicant, the developer of it. What, what you're doing right now is looking at the land use zoning. So there are two, there are two separate items and I think we're, we're combining them a little bit. Yeah. So uh, the, the design of it is it has not even, we haven't engaged anybody yet. And so would there be a point of engaging a consultant if if the it's not an appropriate land use? Right. Yeah. So that's that's the that's the the where we're at right now. Yeah. So Thank if you. if if you don't deem it an appropriate land use, then it would be done, and there would be uh, the next step would not occur. Correct. Okay. So I have a motion on the floor right now to postpone. Is there any more questions? Not seeing. Yeah, Robin moved to postpone. I'll ask for the vote. That is lost. <laughs> Can I get somebody to move second reading for me? Michelle's moving second reading. Oh. Hold on, Robin moves second reading and then move postponement. So, well, his second one was postponement. So I've got the vote on that. So now Robin still is second reading. Yeah, so I don't need Michelle's. I've got Robin for second reading. Any more questions? Not seeing any, vote. Carried. I uh, need somebody to move third reading. Michelle's moving third. Vote. Carried. All right. I don't know if this day's getting longer and confusing me. Easy. Yeah, that was pretty loud. <laughs> 6.2, Tara Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, bylaw 2021-24 Municipal Development Plan, second and third reading. Dustin's moving second. Do you have any comments? No, I think it's good the way it's written uh, with the amendments. So. Okay. Moving second with the amendments. Any other questions? Not seeing any? Oh. Carrie. Third reading. Richard. Vote. Carried. Yeah. I was I was just going to say thank you for your work on that. That was an awesome document and looks great. So you'll continue to see more of Peter with the land use bylaws. So you'll see him again very soon. <laughs> thank you. Uh, number seven, Tarlin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before you is the uh, the reports, uh, administrative reports. Is there any questions? Richard, you're moving them. Oh, no, I guess I don't need you to move them. Just no, not till we're done, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I have a question on spraying. Uh, what? 
sometime in the summer, maybe it was earlier in the spring, we talked about a weed that's out there and um, our staff is not mobilized yet to do that spraying. And uh, I'm just wondering, has, has the Ag Board talked to, um, uh, to Lisa about it, about hiring a private contractor? And I don't know what weed it was, but I just know that her summer staff doesn't come in till, uh, till uh, when? Downy Rome. Downy Rome. Is it Downy Rome? Okay. Downy and uh, I just thought, geez, is, it, is, is that because in Terlin's report, there was talk about the uh, staff is out um, spraying? I just wondered, are we on top of that situation? Uh, I got two hands going up. Jeffrey, or whoever wants to take it. Well, I'll defer to the Ag Service Board members that are on the <laughs> council, but I do have a comment about that, so I'll let hey, them go first. Dustin, how about you? Uh, it, it was a conversation <laughs> that we did have at one of the meetings, I can't remember which, but uh, we did have the discussion about getting out and, and trying to get some of the spring done beforehand, it's just our, our staff that we have. Um, but it is a real hard thing to get a handle on. Okay, Jeffrey. So that's correct. Yeah. So the, the concern also is that <clears throat> with our current staff, of course, downy brome has to be sprayed in um, basically early May, early to mid May, because that before it heads out. And with the staff that we have, um, Sometimes our weed, weed, um, our ag students aren't quite here or up to, up to ready to roll out just yet. And um, the other concern is that with our, our permanent staff is that uh, that's also perhaps the same time that our rental equipment, our seed drills and stuff need to go as well. So, so there's kind of, you know, um, conflicting um, priorities when it comes to our staff resources. So. Uh, Shane. All right. I got a couple comments then. Uh, on the Downey Broom there, Richard, our staff has done some test areas with the chemical company because to spray it at its present, it, it kills everything. So they're looking at a different chemical. They got some test plots with this company, so they're looking at it. So on the Downey Broom, uh, a couple things. The greater maintenance of the <laughs> road edges for weeds. Boy, did I, my phone light up when that grader went down and started knocking the weed tops off. I got one guy spent four and a half hours to five hours with two tractors picking up all them weeds from his fence line. He was not happy. So I explained to him why we had to do it because of the dryness and fire and that. And he understood. He said, well, maybe we should have got out a little earlier. Well, I mean, it's, we got a big area. So, I mean, it's something, it was damn if you do and damn if you don't type situation with that. But just so you know, there was a lot of, I got a lot of complaints about it with the grader going down and knocking them tumbleweeds off. I said in some areas we were just hoping where there wasn't much that they would just lay in the ditch bottom and rot in there. But some of them did with the winds that we had going with the fence, go against the fence and that. And Kim, this this for you. And I just noticed that when I pulled up today, uh, I noticed we got a big new pile of cold mix sitting next door. Do we do quality control on that mix, or who does the QC on that? We do random samples and send them off. For uh, and so we get that. We used to have two or three people that would provide cold mix, and right now there's only one person that provide it here. Um, so we get it through their batch, and so we do. A, we send a, uh, about two samples off per pile. Okay, so we do do it. Don't yeah. Okay, thanks. And, oh, and back to the the weed situation. In your mind, could we start a little earlier, or did we start, or just got ahead of us this year, and then we had to quit because of uh, mowing the weeds, and then. Is it something that we all have to look at? Because I know our bylaw states we have to have a, you know, the water truck uh, behind us. But when it's dry out, and I know we, you know, this year we post, you know, shut it all down, but we could do the stuff in the irrigation areas, like the county and Newell did. Do we have to make a change of policy on that so we can work, do 
in the irrigation areas so we don't get so far behind instead of shutting it all down? Yep, through the chair, I'll answer the first question. First was, yeah, we could, we started, uh, I think we started mowing, the reason why we do our first cut, I think we started, uh, I think it was the third or fourth week of May for our first cut. And we try to do three cuts a, a season. So um, we definitely could start earlier, but it, um, it and where we got caught this year was, um, was with the kosha and not being able to mow that second cut. And when we got the information from from the fire chief, it was no no mowing. So we just followed what the direction was. And that's in our policy is that the fire chief has full authority. So we just follow what we're told. Yeah, like with the Downey broom, I, I think we need to, uh, like move forward as best we can is having right now we have no policy as I understand because there are areas of the county where there is no downy broom and people really don't like seeing it move in along the roadsides and we just ignore it I, I think we should attack it as good as we can and I know like my area south we have no downy broom the only downy broom we have is imported with something uh, no, I got a bunch from Manitoba. Last time it was dry and it took me a while to get rid of that crap. <laughs> no, I just, I'd like to see us have a policy that we do it, to try to control it as best we can in at least the areas that have no downy. Uh, just to further the mowing. So I think from experience though, uh, it has been noted that in the irrigation areas that mowing can take place. That so to, it, so it is the, the policy is for the fire chief to determine that, but I think experience from this year has shown that there can be, it can be flexible in some areas. I uh, had an ex-service board meeting at the beginning of, or the end of last month. Uh, other than that, uh, just doing a little campaigning, that's about it. Uh, it's been a busy last couple of weeks. Um, so last council meeting, I was kind of jumping in and out uh, as it was the FCM board meetings that week. Um, later, later on, on the, I guess we had council on the Tuesday or Wednesday um, that week, I ran for the chair of the rural caucus with the Federation of Canadian Municipalities and was successful in getting that position, um, which is exciting. Um, it's a really good opportunity for uh, Southern Alberta, uh, rural Alberta. Um, Want to thank council obviously for uh, all of your support in helping me to, to, to get to that position and uh, looking forward to uh, seeing where that where that goes. Obviously, I need to be reelected in a couple of weeks to maintain the spot, but uh, the, the role of rural chair is obviously from FCM's perspective in the board, uh, I'm elected by uh, rural Alberta to serve on the board. Um, so when we have our board meetings, I represent rural Alberta at the board level and within committees uh, with uh, the, the position of the rural chair. Um, I chair the rural caucus. And then when it comes to federal advocacy at the ministerial level and the prime minister's office when FCM meets with them, the, the role of the rural chair is to represent rural Canada. And uh, so the, the, the role will bring some good opportunity for us as a, as a county to have contacts and connectivity to some of the highest levels of government in, in our federal government. And uh, so I'm, I'm hopeful that in, in two weeks things go uh, as I as I'd like them to, and that we can continue to, do, to continue to move forward with that. Uh, and it's exciting, and I, I think that uh, we've got some really neat things to come from that down the road. So, uh, yesterday I had my first meeting with RMA. They have formed a federal advocacy team, uh, which I'm a part of, along with Kara Westerland, Paul McLaughlin, um, uh, Wyatt. Uh, Gerald and Tasha Blumenthal. And uh, so 
RMA is, is taking it upon themselves to form this federal advocacy team to be able to bring Alberta specific issues to the federal government. Uh, SARM and SUMA and Saskatchewan do similar things with uh, some of their uh, commodity issues with wheat and canola. Uh, they actually have a, a federal team that goes to Ottawa that advocates for the needs of their region specifically because you don't always have that as a federal voice. And uh, so, yeah, that was exciting. There's some, some neat things. Obviously, one of the big priorities that they're focusing right now on after the pandemic is the rural broadband issue and making sure that we get some movement on that, uh, along with uh, issues pertaining to the RCMP. Uh, we had some good discussions within FCM with regards to how to handle uh, the retroactive paying uh, for the RCMP that, that was coming out. So uh, FCM was uh, we put forward a, a strongly supported resolution that uh, SCM asked the federal government to actually cover retroactively those those uh, costs. And so hopefully that'll help some of the smaller municipalities with that as well. But there's ongoing uh, conversations with regards to what that negotiation looks like and how it could impact small rural communities. So um, we'll keep you in the loop with that as it as it unfolds. I had a community futures entrepreneur uh, meeting. Um, it used to be that community futures entrepreneur was known as a kind of a lender of last resort and uh, people um, that uh, struggled to get a bank loan would come in and then present their business plan and uh, for a higher interest rate because it was a bit of a, a risk, more risk. Um, the, uh, the, the loans officers would take a hard look at it and approve or not approve. So we still do that, but they're also really involved with the college and as far as um, um, entrepreneurship, um, they have been the one of the main distributors for the city of Manasnat for small business loans. Um, the city had put up quite a bit of money and uh, the, the uh, city businesses could apply for assistance. The federal government is, is the main supplier of funding for Entrecor, and um, they've also come up with some numerous programs. And uh, an example of uh, how they help working with the community is that um, there was um, $157,000 roughly that was left over from the, the city's downtown um, association. And so Community Futures is running the city's downtown beautification program. Um, we've got staff that are working on numerous virtual things, um, numerous, so much is online and uh, there's just numerous programs that are de being developed and uh, the federal government is um, supplying a lot of funding to keep things going. I also had a call yesterday to um, take a tour of the of what EDF is doing out there on these on these windmills. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Dan was busy, so I had I went by myself. But um, one of the fellows that was here, uh, Ron Barg, he was sitting in the far corner. He is a representative for EDA, and he has said that any time that administration and or councilors would like to take a tour of what's going on out there, he would arrange it. Uh, it doesn't have to be a big group tour, but two or three people, um, <clears throat> half a dozen, he would be glad to take them around. And uh, the one picture did show what the uh, base site, uh, what the, or pardon me, what the base looks like for those windmills. And um, <clears throat> you go out there now and what was some pretty fantastic looking farmland is just all cut up into, of course, raw dirt and roads and stuff. And, and it will look a whole lot better in two years from now, but I had no idea of the massive undertaking that it, it requires for uh, a windmill project. So um, the, the offer is there. Um, Ron, Ron's easy at whole living, I can get the phone number, but he's offered to take anybody around that would like to see it, so, and, I think it's something that is good to see in the development stages because we know there's more coming. Uh, the Bull Trail one, 
will uh, actually be about 60 windmills versus the 46 that are being proposed right now. So um, it would help council, I think, to, um, well, and administration just to uh, see some of the challenges that are out there. So, and a few other phone calls on some transformer stations and general public phone calls. So, and fortunately staff is helping me with those. <laughs> had the egg service board meeting here at the end of september and i was in went to up to help michelle went to Shure there and served breakfast on the saturday of their show and shine and stuff and that was it well, i too was at that egg service meeting had a couple of safer few meetings um, FCSS news is that uh, at our last board meeting, we decided to give $750 to staff to get a item for the auction sale in at the convention in November. And I'm here to say that we got one for $500, which is a, an experience for the Risa Ranch. And then a local artisan was uh, they're trying to get a painting from her. And I was told today that that happened. So, and then the rust and shine was a big success. Actually, there were over 60 vehicles there this year, which was almost double what we had last year. There wasn't as many people, but it was wonderful to serve breakfast with Shane and Rebecca. And it was a lot of fun. I think that's about it. Ernest. <laughs> Well, I, I had a, a PEP meeting and that was about it. Uh, on the PEP meeting, uh, hydrogen is becoming the focus of uh, what we're for this region that, uh, and actually had a explanation of how hydrogen will be used as a fuel. You won't be using hydrogen in your vehicle, like a hydrogen powered vehicle. It's used to like, to boost the, because uh, of the high combustion rate and stuff. Like you can use it on a diesel tractor or a truck and it'll burn cleaner gasoline. That's where the hydrogen will be used and it'll, and assumedly there is a ton of it on the, in this area. So it changes your octane. Yeah, it just raises your octane and burns so much cleaner and, but there's a little bit to go because that stuff's a little dangerous. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Elf? Yeah, and I also was at the, well, virtual meeting with Pep. And um, like Ernie's saying, the hydrogen is a big thing right now. So um, when it's all done and said, it's say it'll be like 30% cheaper than diesel will be. And also um, concerns were, like, you know, where are you going to store this stuff? Like, you know, with the ag industry and that, like, you know, with the farmers and ranchers, you know, because like Ernie was just saying, like, you know, it's very, you know, combustible and whatnot. So, you know, so they're addressing all that right now, too. So, Dustin, you had more to add? We were just talking about hydrogen. <laughs> <laughs> but if you actually do want to know, I've actually been running hydrogen on some of my pumping motors for a number of years now. And it's actually a very, very efficient way to make a natural gas motor a lot more fuel efficient. Natural gas burns quite cold and it's, uh, it, it's efficient, but inefficient all at the same time. You can't actually get your horsepower qualities out of a pump. So by injecting hydrogen into it, we've uh, managed to bring our fuel costs down to about half. Uh, mm. And while doing that, we can also uh, make them run cooler and more efficient so it's actually if there's a big industry in that now they're actually starting to research it it's it's awesome i'm happy they're doing it on a bigger scale good thanks for sharing that with us hey i had uh, a couple of cypress view meetings with michelle we've got some more coming up this week we will inform you what's going on there but at this point we can't uh mirrors and reeves meeting last friday there's a couple things out of that. The question was asked why the border isn't open for us to drive across to the US right now. And the 
reasoning for it is because the U.S. does not want to open up. They, they keep Mexico and Canada on the same terms and they don't want to open up the border for the Mexican side. So that's why the Canadian side is not opened up. They won't, they won't break the two out. So yeah, at least we don't have a wall to climb over. <laughs> and then there is, uh, I didn't bring my notes. I can't think of the, it was the old man river. They have a program out there with, uh, the federal money for buying trees for this area. So I gave the information to our staff and they're gonna look into seeing what we could do for trees, even for along the railroad tracks out in Irvine, just to be a buffer. Even if it's not a campground, it could be planted in to get some noise down. So across the highway, yeah. But So those were the two I brought back out of the Mares and Reeves. Uh, other than that, just a whole bunch of phone calls on stuff. It's been busy with that part of it. Yeah, we all got earfuls this time around. But uh, get somebody to move the, Dustin's gonna move the Raven Council reports. Vote. Carried. Oh, what are we at? 9.1, Tara Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before you, is a request from Western uh, Tractors uh, Local Improvement uh, request for uh, for forgiveness. Uh, on page uh, 170 is the letter from uh, uh, Western Tractor. Um, in your agenda on page uh, 168. Uh, there is the recommended motion and what we administration is now has changed and would like to amend that motion, uh, recommended motion to be as follows. Council of direct administration to further vet the requested amount uh, to and to present alternative options at the November 2nd council meeting as the decision will impact future councils. Okay, thank you. Uh, Robin. All right. Um, so move moving for information to get talking and then I can amend it to that recommend it too. So when you say Carolyn that to, to vet it more, is that because you're questioning whether or not it's reasonable or accurate, or you're just considering more along the lines of whether this council decides or next council decides? Um, I guess what we're, what we're looking for is that the, the amounts in the letter, um, are, are very likely true, uh, but there was nothing to support that claim of, of those particular amounts to go back and say the, the vetting part of it, um, on, on the other note, um, it, it's, it's a very involved project. Uh, we're looking at a 2021 project and a 2018 project. And while it seems very reasonable to connect those two, um, the, the, the management or the developer's decision to go ahead with that project in 2018 may not have had any bearing on council's de decision in 2021 to continue on with that project because of the opportunity. Uh, it, it's not unreasonable to, to look at them together, but they would be again that those separate type type things. But if Kim, I don't. Which uh, that makes sense. I, I guess one of the things we should look at, Robin, is the project that was done this year is all done on grant funding that was put together for that project. So it's not coming out of well, it does everything comes out of the repairs pocket, but. That came out of the grant funding. So by us returning this back, we can't we can't filter that into the project because it was previously done. So we can't, you know, to get it out of that grant funding, it doesn't work. So we're actually taking it out of our revenues to refund that. And like Steve said, that was something back in 2018. They wanted it. That's what it was at that point of time. So yeah, I suppose there's my, what my question on where I'm maybe seeking personal clarity is that if this is being brought forward by staff, so if it's a letter that's been written, to me, this the vetting 
should have happened prior to this coming to our agenda. Should we, they, we shouldn't have to give permission or ask them to vet it. I'm just thinking that along, like, that's what I'm kind of computing as I'm hearing right now. And so if the letter, cause it's, if it's coming from staff, but I'm getting that this is coming from the ratepayer asking for something, we're receiving it and we're making an operational decision right now versus a governance decision. And so in, with that being said, I'll amend my motion to return it to staff for vetting. Um, but I'm thinking that probably in the future, it can be vetted and then proposed by staff as either approval or a rejection. That makes sense? Yeah, I think it just got overlooked because the numbers were, people were looking at it as a grant issue and now it's not gonna be in that grant issue. So it got overlooked on the actual okay. numbers. Okay, thank you. Is that, it's a fair statement. Richard? Is, is it okay to comment a little bit about that, um, this ask, this concern, or should I wait till next time? Well, you can comment on it. Okay, so so one of the reasons that um, they're asking is, that of course, nobody else had to do it. And back in 2018, when this proposal was brought forward, and I am open for any corrections on this, but at the time, the only requirement that uh, we had for um, developing a turn off, uh, turn off was, was something that was so simple, it was really no cost to it. And I, I revert back to the co-op corner or the co-op turnout and also the Ag Plus one. It was a little strip of road that uh, actually uh, our, our uh, bicycle lanes or our trails are actually wider than that. And then, so they brought this proposal forward to develop this piece of land and build that. And then in the planning commission part of it is when it was said that we would like to see better, a safer uh, turnout, uh, a safer um, intersection treatment. And it was looked at and said, okay, well, we're gonna take B, okay? And nobody had any idea of the cost of that until the Western Tractor people actually had to do it. And they agreed that, okay, whatever the county would wish or the planning commission wishes, we will do that, okay? But there was no comparison to what we had held to a standard from before that. And I think this came as a complete surprise to them, yet they stepped up to the plate and continued with the development and they, they paid their way and they're just looking now and saying, wow, all those other people ended up with those same approaches that we actually put in there. And, and I think Cypress County liked what they saw with Western Tractor and that was almost the standard that they carried through for the rest of them. So there's, there's gotta be a little bit of thought there to the fact that I'm not gonna say we blindsided them, but it was completely uh, they, they come out of nowhere, okay? The increased cost. So you're going from a $5,000 turnout to a $400,000 turnout, okay? Shane? There is no such thing as a $5,000 turnout. Yeah, there is, but it's just. Uh, it, does, it's, it, it costs. It costs more than five. No, 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 but I, know, I know what you're getting at. But you got to remember, they agreed to it. Or they didn't. They yeah. did it. It's the way things were moving forward. I mean, at that time, we, you know, okay, now this is probably going to be the new standard. The co-op and everything was built beforehand. So regulations and everything changes as you go. Yeah. So you can't keep going back and all say, well, I built my house. You changed the rules, but I built my house 10 years ago. I had to do this. Now you're changing. You know, give me some money back. You know, it's Things move along. But it's, it's a tough one. Yeah, Robin. So what I'm what I'm hearing you say, Richard, is that we're kind of looking at this from a what's the right thing to do, and it's almost like a endeavor to insist type of thing. Where I, I think about what happened over at Egg Plus, and we had requirements for what they needed to do. They requested that we hang tight uh, and enforce them to do it until we've got our design done. And then they paid for what was over and above, but we didn't have them do the whole intersection only to come in and then redo the whole intersection, right? And if, if we had 
numerous and, and maybe staff can correct me if I'm overlooking something here, but if we had numerous locations along that, that main road where we've had other people do this, um, it might be a little bit different, but I think this is kind of a one-off on the 120. Um, Egg Plus did do an improvement at one point in the co-op there. Um, I don't think that they're asking for us to pay for the whole thing, but it is worth asking the question and, and then contemplating as council is, is it the right thing to potentially work with them a little bit um, versus just putting them in a position where just because they were a year and a half earlier that uh, they have to front the whole thing. Because like the main, the main difference in philosophy here is that it's a developer pay approach versus what we've done now is we said, no, let's go and put it in all major intersections. And so we've kind of changed our philosophy a little bit on this. And so is it the right thing to kind of retroactively look at making a bit of a, a meet in the middle kind of a thing? Not saying that it is or isn't, it's just a thought, right? Um, hold on, I got Ernest. Well, this to me is a business deal. This is not about what, you know, Goods Corner had or what the co-op done or who did. This was a business deal. They were moving for Medicine Hat. They wanted the land, uh, substantially reduced their taxes. And to do what they wanted to do, they had to do it. They really needed an approach on that road. You, you couldn't do that without doing an approach. And they agreed to build and pay for the approach. I mean, this is no different than if you agreed to buy a house and then the house price went, it went, went across the street, went down 30%. Now you go to your mortgage lender and go, I want my money back. You know, I want to reduce it. I think they pay the bill. It, it was a business agreement and it should stay that way. Shane? Yeah, one thing, like Erna said, it was a business deal. You got to remember, we weren't going to do the intersections to begin with. Till the grant funding come. It was just going to be the selecting. Ag Plus would have had to do theirs if we wouldn't have did them intersections. The grant funding wouldn't come through. And I sat here, it was one, you're one of the prior uh, public works superintendent. First brought forward, not even to repave it. It was just going to be a micro lift on it. So that's all we were originally looking to do. If we would have did that, it wouldn't be a safe, but we, Got the grant funding, we made the roads safer throughout. And like Ernest said, at that time, three years ago, it was a business deal. Things do change, you know, stuff. So I agree with staff to bring it, you know, back and go from there. Yeah, that's what I was going to say is a grant funding changed the whole aspect of everything. If we hadn't got that grant funding, everybody would be doing their own improvements on that if they wanted to do a business there. So. Yeah, well, I, I think the thing that council has to know is that Western Tractor is not upset with council. They're yeah. not upset with administration. They're just saying, is there any chance that we could get some kind of money back? And so if they, we can't, it's, it's not the end of the world for them. But as earnest as good, well, just earnest, but as business people, any everybody else most people would ask too right so that's that's where it's coming from if you don't ask you can't get it yeah. So. yeah oh no there's some left but we can't allocate it to that because it was previously done that's the problem it, we can't touch it. it we can do other improvements along there with that grant funding because it's for the 120 but anything that was previously done, we cannot do. Any other comments on it? Or? I just so uh, if if it, if this doesn't go through, that if uh, administration would write a letter to Western Tractor and explain the circumstances, please. Well, the motion we have right now is to bring back for the next meeting in November. Okay. So maybe we'll look at it and do some numbers at that point or a new council might look at it. Okay, motion on the floor made by Robin. Any more questions or comments? Oh. Carried. Is that? Oh, he's grumpy today. 9.2, Tara Lynn. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Organizational meeting. Um, accordance to 192 of the MGA, you need to have a organizational meeting no later than two weeks after the uh, third uh, Monday in October's election. The recommended motion as a council council cancel the regular scheduled October 19th, 2021 meeting and hold the organizational meeting October 26, 2021 uh, at 10 a.m. No. Well, I was going to say who says you're going to be here, but I guess you're a place. <laughs> you're the only one we know is going to be here. <laughs> uh, is that Dustin? You're making that? Any questions about it? Vote? Carried. 10.3, Tarlin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Rock Tarlin Point, point uh, gas storage tax penalty refund request. Um, before you is the information and a letter from Rock Point requesting uh, a uh, for uh, the penalty uh, to uh, be forgiven and the recommended motion that council direct administration to uphold the penalty as it is for all for all Rock uh, Point st uh, gas storage and a AECO storage gas storage partnership properties. Shane's making the motion, I guess. Oh, well, Richard, I have to catch up here where we're at, but <clears throat> I'll uh, make the motion to uphold the penalty, and I have the floor, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. So I, I, I wrote down some of those dates, and um, I got July 2nd, the staff made a phone call and also sent them a letter. And it took till August 26 before a call was returned. And then almost uh, well, another three weeks before the check came down. But who was sleeping between the 2nd of July and August 26 in that company? Uh, it's not our problem. Like open your mail, deal with it. And, and uh, not only that, I, staff went to the trouble to make phone calls, make a phone call, leave a message. And they can't return it? Wow. Any other comments or questions? I think we've withheld all the penalties from now on. So, or from the past. So I agree with the motion to withhold it or hold them up. Not seeing any other questions? Vote. Carried. 9.4, Tarlin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before you is the uh, Short Grass uh, Library Board uh, budget and the requisition amount. Um, the recommended motion is that Council approve the 2022 Short Grass Library System 2022 budget and requisition as presented. Um, and if there's any questions, I believe Councillor uh, McKenzie would be able to answer those as she is the uh, member on the board. You're making the motion. Go ahead. Floor is yours. Hey, well, um, we've just gone through the budgeting process and the requisition pro process in the, at our last meeting. And uh, there are numbers, the, the, the amount we get re asked for requisition comes from the province, which gave us numbers. They're, they've always been going off numbers from 2016. And then all of a sudden this year, they changed them to 2021. So everyone's requisition costs have, are supposed to be more. But because of COVID and we've saved so much money in our, our regular budget that we've chosen to uh, not raise our requisition rates this year, they will probably go up next year. But um, and I think such short grass is a very important part of our community. And I believe we should just uh, pay this. If there's any questions, feel free to ask. Any comments, questions? Not seeing any. I'll call for the vote then. Carried. 9.5, Tarlin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. South Dunmore Water Co-op. Uh, Cypress County has been approached by the uh, by the co-op. Uh, to perform uh, operator uh, 
uh, duties for them. And uh, there is information attached in regards to the, the daily, daily and weekly uh, duties, the registration and, and so forth. Um, the recommended, so I met with them about uh, 10 days ago, I guess, give or take. And um, so the recommended motion is that administration, uh, the council directs administration to further discuss with the South Dunmore Water Co-op and furthermore that count, count Cypress County to perform the water operator tasks on a full recovery basis. That is the recommended motion. Robin? I'll move that, Mr. Reef. Okay, any other questions on it? No, I think it's fair that it's done on a full cost recovery because we have a whole bunch of other water co-ops out there too, so. All right, I don't see any comments. I'll ask for the vote. Vote, carried. 9.6, does Jeffrey or still? Um, I can, I'll do it here? and then we'll, okay. yeah. So before you uh, council is uh, several policies. They are the egg service board policies. Uh, the intent of the policies has not changed. It's uh, wording, cleanup, grammar, legislative change, that sort of thing. Um, each uh, uh, each policy will need uh, a motion uh, individually. We can't do a lump one. So, um, so the first one is uh, ASB policy 1.1, the annual 4-H grant. Is there any questions on that? Alf's moving it. Any questions? Can we? I think I had, I had mentioned this or brought this up before. Um, Five hundred dollars nowadays is not a significant donation, um, especially I think coming from a municipality that wants to see more with uh, with agriculture and supporting. I'm just wondering if if there would be an appetite on council to increase this. Dustin, so with the 4-H grant, we the we get an uh, application from them every year for four grant and they ask for $500. So this is their ask and we give it to them. Yeah. I made that simple. Yeah. Okay, I have a motion on the floor to approve as amended. Vote. Oh. Carried. 9.7, Terlin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Policy 2.1, the foam applicator. Is there any questions on the amendments? Dustin's moving it. Any questions? What is a foam applicator? Dustin? It uses a non-toxic foam to take a new goal for control. Uh, it's injected down the holes. And it's uh, for rodent removal, essentially. So we're going to fill the holes at the, yeah, over at the uh, ball diamond before we go level everything. <laughs> it has been available for rent to the community associations for at least the past eight years that I've been around. Uh -huh. Didn't know anything about it. I know about blowing them up, that one, but. <laughs> okay, I have a motion on the floor for it. Any other questions? Vote. Gary, 9.8, Terlin. Thank you, Mr. Cha Chairman. Policy 2.2, the land roller. Uh, please see the amended policy before you. Jane. Jane's moving that one as presented. Any questions? Vote. Carried. 9.9, Terlin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Policy 2.3, no till uh, seed drill. Um, please see the, uh, the amended policy in front. Michelle. Moving it as presented. Any questions? Vote. Carried. 
9.10. Policy 2.4, pipeline plow. Uh, is there any questions on the amendments? Ernest, you're making that motion as presented. Any questions? So that gives me the chance to ask the question. Yep. Does anybody ever use that anymore? Or have we used it or is it just kind of hanging out in the yard? It does. Yeah, it does get used. So it's been used a few times over the last couple of years. It's not a, not a high use item, but it does get used occasionally and the maintenance is highly minimal. It's fine. Uh, my soccer association used it once 10 years ago. I just wondered if there was, if it was used at all. Okay, any other questions? Vote. Carrie, 9.11. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Policy 2.5, the tag reader. Uh, the amended policy is before you for your consideration. Uh, who had that? Robin, your turn. <laughs> Um, as presented, any questions? Vote. Carried. 9-12. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Policy 3.6, pesticide, pesticide container collection. The amended uh, policy is before you for your consideration. Dustin. Moving as presented. Any questions? Vote. Oh, carried. Nine twelve. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before you is the uh, policy six point zero vertebrate uh, pest control. Uh, it is for before you with uh, amendments for your consideration. What's that? Did we do pest control? No, nope, twelve. Can we jump over one? Yeah, yeah, we're on nine thirteen. We did twelve. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So we're on thirteen, right? I'm not losing. No. Oh. No, the one Dustin just did was a reader, wasn't it? Or, oh, he did. Okay, sorry. We're going too quick now. All right. All right. To slow things down, Shane is making this one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any questions? Vote. Okay. 914. Policy 6.1 rat and skunk control. Uh, before you is the amended uh, policy. Is there any questions? Elf. Any questions? Vote. Gary, 915, Terrell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Policy 6.3, pest control. Before you is the amended uh, policy. Is there any questions? Uh, Michelle. I'll move as presented. Thank you. Any questions? Vote. Carried. 916. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, policy 6.5, Dutch Elm Disease Policy. Uh, the amendments are before you for your consideration. Is there any questions on the uh, policy? Ernest is moving this one. As presented. No questions? Whoa. Carried. Right. Right. Good work, Lisa. Thank you. you. Know Thank you. Light the up, you? <laughs> oh, cool. Nine seventeen. Carolyn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's just a quick update on the on a proposed on uh, a proposed substation or options for many substations in uh, in our neck of the woods. And Kayleen, our planning supervisor, will provide updates. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so just to kind of back up the wagon a little bit, uh, November 2020, uh, City of Medicine Hat Electric had contacted the county and they were looking at um, preliminary comments on five different proposed substations. Um, at that time, a few of the substations were located within the boundaries of the county and a few of them were located within the boundaries of the city. Um, so at that time, it was requested that we keep that information confidential. Uh, they were looking at land acquisition and that sort of thing. So we provided very preliminary comments based upon the regulations in our land use bylaw. Um, one of the locations was proposed north of Desert Bloom. So it was communicated at that time that um, the county would request the city's, I guess, discretion in providing for screening measures to try to avoid nuisances and, and sound and, and visual disturbance to that hamlet based upon the residential component for that. Um, since then, we, we know that we received concerns from a few of our, our rate payers along Highway 3. There was a, a second site that was proposed. And September 20th, we received a circulation from the city, and it looks at the two potential sites that the city is currently looking at. So they're at stage one within their process. And the information that they provided um, essentially is that 2020 to 2022, they're doing their site evaluations and their regulatory reviews. And then 2023 to 2025 would be when the project would be requested for approval. And, and that process would go to the Alberta Utilities Commission. Um, so city, I would say, is still very early on in their process. However, this is our opportunity for the county to provide comments if we wish to. And the landowners in the area have that opportunity as well. Thank you, Kaylee. Uh, Richard, do you have any comments? Since... The, um, this piece uh, that, um, the second piece, the first piece is over by the greenhouse on the south boundary. And, and the second proposal that they're talking about is across from the, uh, the small cemetery on the number three highway. There's a wedge of land in there that um, the city itself uh, has never allowed any kind of development because of the high water table and the aquifer. And, and so um, this did come as a surprise to the residents that are living there. And um, I, I think it was more, it was also upsetting with the fact that um, the electrical department tried to imply that Cypress County knew all about this and has known about it for over a year. When in fact, when they, as, as Kayleen just said, they were very vague about what they brought forward and it was also supposed to be kept confidential. So really uh, planning department here didn't know anything any sooner than when the uh, residents in the area found out. It was at the same time. And I just, it's upsetting, it's, it's disrespectful. Um, I, I think that there should have been a ton of more communication. So our repairs are just asking that um, Cypress County would step forward and voice their concerns to Alberta Utilities. Is that who that is? Uh, AUC, yeah, okay. And this is not a little substation. It's a, it's kind of a, well, it's fairly big and it's ugly and it's got lots of, some really high poles. So we're going to have to deal with noise and lighting. So anyway, um, yeah, Kayleen is, is on that. Yeah, and Jeffrey. Say one is by the number three. Yeah. Sarah Lynn. Mr. Chairman and, and Council, also too, when it comes to the AUC and, and being an intervener on, uh, on projects, it is, uh, it's important for the municipality to participate in that process, but it is very important for the area landowners to participate individually as well. Um, for example, we have, an, there's another concern in kind of in that neck of the woods as well. Um, the, uh, the area residents have taken a, a strong stance in regards to that project, and uh, we have put in intervener status as well. So it's vital that the community members participate in the process as well. We need them. Uh, as much as they need us uh, to to get our message across, it's really important. Okay. Sure. 
just putting it out there. If I had my choice, I'd, I'd pick site number one. I recently just put in a kitchen just kind of north of uh, site two, right between Desert Bloom and the new Cooley Ridge. And if that substation goes right there on that corner, it's, yeah, I, I just don't think that's good. There's too many people around there that are going to complain about it. It's blocking Desert Bloom's view. It's blocking Cooley Ridge's view. Go in there. So that's just my opinion. Yeah, and just to reiterate too that I, I think based upon the information that the city provided, they are still very preliminary to me in their in their plans um, and are kind of weighing out the, the options of both sites. So over the next year and a half, it's my understanding that they'll be kind of doing a, a site vetting process, communicating with landowners and that sort of thing. So I think that is our opportunity now to provide those comments. And then thereafter, there would be the second process in which they actually have to apply to the, the government of Alberta, to the AUC, to get that approval. So there's still kind of a, a long process ahead, I would say. That's the only thing that frustrates myself is there's a double standard there because they turned down development on this before when it was somebody, a private developer, now they want to do it. And it's all of a sudden the water tables and that aren't an issue. A little frustrating there. Any other comments or I guess we're just receiving this for information then? Is that, do you need any other motion out of that? Or do you want us a motion for us to be involved with the process, AUC? Yes, maybe a motion for um, administration to provide comments to the city of Medicine Hat on the two proposed sites. Richard started it, so Richard's making that motion. Exactly what Kaylin said. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Vote. Carried. 10.1, Tara Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before you is a request for uh, roads to residents. The, uh, it is on uh, page uh, 235, recommended motions that council direct administration enter into a cost share agreement to construct Township Road 112 and Range Road 50 to, the, to a high grade gravel standard to the near quarter line, to the nearest quarter line of the development in accordance to policy R14. There's uh, background information here as well. And there's alternative recommendation on page 238 is the policy. Is there questions? Um, Dustin, I'll move recommendation number one. Uh, Robin. Thank you. <clears throat> I was uh, I was over at uh, Mr. Plant's residence yesterday. Um, I think that he and Kim have worked out something that works here. Um, with regards to future uh, potential for Endeavor to assess, I know we've done that before. What is the standard for Endeavor to insist? Is it 10 years? Generally? Five. Five. Is it, would it be possible on something like that to, because really if nobody ever moves on to it and never gets implemented, right? But just from an, a, a potential affordability side of things, like if we had the ability to put on, you know, a, a maybe even a 10 year endeavor to assist, something like that, if it's simple enough. Um, the other thing that he had mentioned is that he'd be very interested in uh, utilizing the local improvement to help cover, cover that. And I believe that that's just a, separate bylaw that would be brought forward later on that allows them to pay it off with their taxes over a few years. So um, that was what he asked for me to, to mention. So that's all. It would probably be cleaner if I just made a motion to or a friendly amendment motion or request of you. If, if the motion is to Move, move forward with that. Maybe we could just add to it to do a 10 year endeavor to assist and then to have maybe a second motion afterwards to bring how, what's the process for a, a local improvement bylaw, Caroline? So, uh, what, uh, so 
the motion would be to uh, uh, to do the 10 year with that. Um, and then also too, it would be through bylaw. So there would be a motion to bring that to bring forward the bylaw with the uh, with the costs to do that. My I guess my request for friendly amendment is just the 10 year on the endeavor to assist and then after the vote I can make the second motion. Are you just adding that, Dustin? Tears? So that we don't need a motion from Robin. You're just gonna add it. we'll have to add the, the 10 years to to the, the first one and then have to bring back a motion to uh, another motion to bring the bylaw back for yeah, that's later though. Not yeah. right now. Uh, Richard, old guy here needs a refresher. So endeavor to resist to assist as if somebody else builds uh, a resident along that road, and then they would pick up part of the tab. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. So the motion is as read, with adding with a ten-year endeavor to assist. Any questions on it? Vote. Carried. Now the bylaw will come back in a different next meeting. Yeah, so my today. motion then would be to request that administration come back uh, with when you figured out what the amount would be for a local improvement bylaw for the plant residents. Thank you. Do you need a motion for that or it's just gonna happen with it? Uh, it would be best to, to have a motion for direction yeah. and we'll enter for, so the process is we would enter an agreement and then the individual signs the agreement and then the bylaws brought forward. Okay. So Robin's making that motion. Any questions? Vote. Carried. 10.2, Terrilyn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the pneumatic packer asset addition. So then the background here in uh, in 2020 council approved administration to purchase a used cat dynamic I can never say that word. That that packer uh, uh, to be utilized in the county use oiling program. Unfortunately, the unit was sold prior to the county being able to finalize this purchase. As an alternative, the county leased a unit for the 2021 season, as uh, as this is uh, significantly more efficient than the previous tractor wobbly wheel setup. Six months lease carried a cost of 9,500 a month and will expire at the end of October. The county has an option to purchase this unit at completion of the lease agreement. The total cost of this unit is 136. If the option is exercised, 91% of the total lease of payments of 51,870 will be allocated against the total capital purchase and there would be remaining of 84,130. Uh, if the option to purchase is not exercised, all payments made uh, will be treated as rental payments with no amount being covered. The price, uh, 21 price is currently 155. The recommended motion, Mr. Chairman, is a council, council authorize the purchase of that pa packer compactor with the total cost not exceeding 140 to be funded from the equipment fund. And that council direct administration a sole source of purchase from Finning by exercising the option within the current CAT packer rental agreement. Okay. Uh, Shane's making that motion. You have a floor. You have any comments? We need that thing, so I think it's a good deal. Okay. Any other comments? I'll ask for the vote. Vote. Carried. What was that? Okay. So sorry. sorry about that. I didn't see the second part. Dustin's making the second part. Everybody knows what it is. Vote. Carried. 11.1, Terrellin. Mr. Chairman, can we have a five minute break, please? No, nope. we're running behind.
Okay, um, we need to go back to I'm trying to find the org, the org meeting. Yeah, org meeting. I missed uh, Shane putting his hand up. He cannot be here that day, and we know that he's acclaimed them back in, so it does matter. So instead of the Tuesday, can we change it to the Monday? For the org meeting. Yeah, so no, instead of the 26th, wing. it would be the 25th. That's for everybody knows that's my weaning day, and I got everything organized. Yeah. And we don't need him weaning away around here. Sure. <laughs> he does enough of it all year. So, <laughs> so it'll be the okay. Monday. So it's that day. What, what time, time is yours? Ten. How about the Wednesday? Okay. I need to go to Saskatoon. I'm supposed to be in Saskatoon on the 25th, um, but I can easily put it off and to the and leave after the Monday. If we wait till Wednesday, then I'm going to be pooping myself on something that I've got crews lined up. Well, how about how about we start at 11? How about how we start at 11? On the so Councillor Elf has a has an important appointment. Two months to get a doctor's Oh yeah, that, that takes priority. So which day are you thinking, Elf? Or one o'clock? No, you can still do it. Even. Let's do it at one o'clock on the Monday. Yes. If for the ones that are appointed. Is this just the organizational meeting? Yeah. So when is the council meeting scheduled for? Because that was the second. The second of November. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're just completely skipping that mid meeting in October. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because when it falls, uh, it's tough when it like in the like 18th in the middle of the month, right? So, so what do I do with that motion that's there? Like, just make this motion to supersede the other one. Who who made that? Who made the who made that motion? Just to move it to the Monday and at one o'clock. Yeah. So Robert's okay. book of rules says that you can do a motion to reconsider as long as it's made by somebody that was a part of the of winning the vote. So anybody really could make a motion to reconsider. We retable it, revote. Well, Dustin's just made a friendly amendment. Okay. So the amendment is to move it to one o'clock on Monday. Last call. Last call. <laughs> uh, it's any Monday. One. Right? Any Monday, the twenty fifth of October. 2021. Yes, okay. <laughs> 1 p.m. Anything else you need? No. <laughs> okay, vote. Carried. There we go. Sorry about that, Shane. 11.2. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So before you is the 2022 equipment replacement plan. In there is the vehicle and equipment and roads and bridges. Um, today is just an uh, in, um, just introducing you to the the document. Uh, it's a vast document. Um, no expectation to discuss bringing it forth to you that you have received it, and uh, it will be uh, uh, brought back for the November second meeting. Jane, I don't Jane, know if you guys you noticed, but there's a lot going on November second. <laughs> allocation. Well, uh, you want to go first? Did you want to ask that? The allocation of money, whether or not? What you're asking? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, you're good then? Yeah. Okay, go ahead, Rob. Yes, yeah, so my, my question was just going to be with regards to this and us receiving it for information um, is when are you hoping to present the budget for that? And because I'm thinking this is a lot of information to be presented prior to a new council potentially making a decision on the information that we're currently receiving for information. Um, are we talking about kind of end of November, early December? Or so it depends on what happens in the election. Uh, it will be introduced again on uh, November 2nd uh, for, for some discussion. 
and uh, and discussion because capital goes with with operating and operating goes with capital. So just start that process. So it will be back on the on the table uh, the November second meeting. Mm -hmm. um, it is administration's uh, hope that the first meeting in December the ca uh, capital and the operating will be approved. Okay, so. As a, a first term counselor and remembering my first meetings going into budget season, it was super overwhelming to have a ton of information in front of you and having been expected to read it for the first time and then discuss it on a operational level. Um, is it possible to like, I'd be happy to move this for information, but to bring it back at the November meeting for addition, like for information again, not to have that discussion or do we table it now and then bring it back for information November the second, just as a courtesy for for whoever's in. Yeah, and 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 very much so. We just have to play it by ear and see what 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 happens. But November second is the goal to bring it back as information again, and if able to start discussion on it. If not, it would come back to the the next one. Okay. We just got to play it by ear. Yeah. Uh, so by the end of uh, before before the uh, end of December. Uh, in particular, an operating budget must be approved to spend money January 1st. And it is it is tough and it's unfair that it it's for for people to just come on. It's a lot to do and a lot to take on, a lot to learn in a heck of a hurry. You just kind of hope that your previous council has kind of set it up that it's a flawless until you get used to it. Shane, go ahead. This is for you, Kim. Or 2022, 20, number one, two, and three. You would probably try to put all that together as a, a one tender deal again to get the best bang for our buck. That's the direction I received was try to make them tendering so that we're all we're going after. And that was where um that's why those three ones are actually shelf ready. They're they're already uh designed and engineered. So once we get those approved, then we'll do what we did with the 120, give that long, long lead time and try to get people that are out, you know, competitive for that, uh, for those work. Yeah, because, you know, you were looking at, you know, about another, you know, a $7 million project, which, yep. so we'll probably which hopefully get will that. attract a lot of attention. And that was, uh, and with that, just because you, I don't know if it's, it didn't get on the spreadsheet, but the reason why they were highlighted in red on that left-hand column is we have alternate um, recommendations to us to discuss at a future when we go over that. So um, phase two in 2023 has the 7.3 million. And we also have that priced out for chip seal all the way down there too. So we're just working on traffic counts and trying to gather that information for council. Any other questions? I have a most motion on the floor from Robin to receive her information. Oh, carried. Uh, I need a motion to go in camera. Oh, we have one more, the IT. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Already, it's already checked off. <laughs> So now I'm gonna kind of change gears here. So the, the 22 uh, IT infrastructure plan, we're asking for council to review and to approve today. Um, IT takes, a, uh, any equipment takes a while to uh, procure and get delivered. Uh, the IT reserve is fully funded with, uh, with when you have technology, uh, it, the price of things, if it was a thousand bucks to buy when you have to, when you have to get it and whenever it depreciates out, it's usually 700 bucks. So our, our IT is, is fully funded. Uh, there is no new items on the IT plan. It is servers, servers mainly and a uh, photocopier, I believe. And so we ask, uh, we ask that uh, council considers to approve that uh, today so we can procure that. Michelle's making the motion. Well, I don't know. That yeah. That's maintenance. Sure. Yeah, you can answer the question, Les. 
Yeah, so um, Trevor was in this morning to replace the bulbs. He replaced it. Unfortunately, it's still flickering. So it is the um, the outlet itself. So yeah, he's looking at a few other things. So I'll be bringing it back. For now, we could get you a lamp. <laughs> okay. No, you can't have a new Commodore, Dustin. <laughs> That's what Dustin calls us set up here. It's a Commodore. Okay, any other questions about the IT? Well, we actually, I forgot to ask Leslie Ann this morning. But we could have gone back to voting on this because of the, we're offline, but I forgot to ask you this morning. Shane just asked that question. So. Okay, no more questions. Vote. Carried. Well, we record them. We're just, if you zoom in, then we can't go back to this voting. But if all of us are here, we can vote. All right. I need a motion to go in camera.
Vote. Carried. Okay. All so, right, so we're back to 12 1. 12 1. Postpone until strategic planning. Well, there's the recommended motion there, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, to do it or direct administration accordingly. Um, okay, so the one I have written down that we discussed in camera was to postpone until strategic planning with the new council. Perfect. So everybody's good with that? Um, <coughs> Dustin's making that. Vote. Carried. 12.2 is to receive for information. Correct. Shane? Yep. Vote. Carried. The last two, we don't need anything, do we? Correct. We don't need anything. All right. That is it for today. Uh, for the three that are still here, good. <laughs> congratulations for... Yeah, congratulations for being here for the next four years. And to the rest that are out campaigning, good luck. And hopefully we see everybody in the next council meeting. October 25th. October 25th, yeah, at 1 p.m. Mr. Chairman, on behalf of administration, you guys are an awesome group to work with. And we truly appreciate everything, appreciate everything that you guys do for us and do for your communities. And, and we truly wish you uh, best of luck. And uh, yeah, kind of a tough day today. Yeah, could be our it's, last it's for some of it's, us. So. It's a tough day today. So you guys are awesome to work with and we truly appreciate you. Thank you very much.